be on the channel. So we're good. Hello. Welcome to the show where we are all alcoholics and drinking and talking about A Song of Ice and Fire. I have a non Game of Thrones copyrighted. Why am I echoing my own ears? Because I have the stream up because I'm terrible. Rookie mistake. <laughs> it's so because you're two, drinking. <laughs> these two have Game of Thrones branded liquor. I do not. So we will just pretend that I do. And welcome back. So you're not wearing a Game of Thrones sweater. You're just, are you, you even a fan? You don't recognize this from season two? Come on. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? Like, the dire Probably. wolves don't look like that in when I imagine them. Uh... <laughs> they do in my head, Kate. All right, so A Clash of Kings. Nothing really happened in this book, right? We can, we can just talk about the next one. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> What a sequel. So we know that Jimmy here has six pages of notes as he just told us. Do you want to just read through them real quick while me and Alex drink and then we can actually get to chatting? I, I was mean, actually hoping that you prepared a PowerPoint that we could follow along. Yeah. I mean, Kick back, I do learn. have a PowerPoint. No, I'm just kidding. Could this is imagine? like basically like we all came to class and we're hoping that Jimmy, the class nerd, just takes up the entire class time with his project so we just don't me. get called on. <laughs> like, oh, you know, we don't have time for anyone else's project today. So, oh, no. <laughs> just take one for the team. That's all. All right. So where do we want to start? I know you have the notes to, well, to guide I us, but where should we start? First of all, this is another great book of course and coming back to these is just eye-opening how good they were yeah because it's been so long for me since i've read them anyway and then having watched the show and having all that like in my brain because i've seen that so many times and being able to see everything that was on screen adapted and like the differences super fun but uh but yeah no, where, where do you want to start <laughs> aha uh i think the beginning is always a good place to start it absolutely that's kind of standard that's fine let's start at the end (laughs) i mean the prologue is phenomenal it is i do like how the prologue is um i mean like just like with the first book that it's a thing that the prologue isn't from one of the main povs Mm -hmm. yeah who's jingling um my cat who decided to find her jingliest toy (laughs) classic it's very festive so let's talk about the prologue then i mean the prologue is essentially a short story in itself um it even has it has its own climax it has a little bit of a twist right and it establishes characters uh in a way that are very memorable um and Mm -hmm. it feels like a really natural way of expanding your story and george is phenomenal at expanding scope without making it feel exposition-y, without making mm-hmm. it feel overwhelming. I mean, there's so many times... Actually, you know, a really good example of this, I think. I just read Thomas Covenant, or part of Thomas Covenant, book one. Yeah. Um, Lord Files Priest of, Bane. Priest of... What? It's like... Uh, um, Priest of Bones? No, 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 no. no. It's the, the Thomas Covenant from Stephen Donaldson. It's Lord Files Bane. It's written in like the 70s. No, um, okay, no. Very, it's very... It's a controversial work for multiple reasons, mm-hmm. but... Um, I feel like in that book, like I actually put it down because I'm not, I'm not ready for it, but it's just like, he just dumps things on you every chapter yeah. where in the world is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but it's just like, he just dumps it. And I just, I, I'm not meshing with it at all. It feels like I'm being told about it. Whereas like through this new POV, George is showing you a whole new group of people in a new location. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, it has a climax. Like, like the prologue is a short story. Um, and there's just tons of war and history that's getting, uh, you know, fleshed out and it's just deep. It's a great prologue. I mean, it's a great way to introduce you to, you know, Stannis and dragon, uh, Dragonstone and all the, the, you know, red priest, well, a whole nother religion. And, like you yeah. in the first book, you had like the old gods with the mm-hmm. weirwood and you have the sept and yes. you have like, okay, those are the two religions, but now we're like, yeah. okay, we're going to add a third. And then later, we're going to add a fourth. <laughs> like, just like add in your religious studies as we go. <laughs> yeah, and, and and religion plays such a big role in A Song of Ice and Fire. And this is the book where it really comes out. Uh, yeah. Like it's obviously old gods, new gods are talked about in the Game of Thrones. I think there's a little bit of a mention of Relore in book one. But here we actually see, you know, this daunting priestess, you know, Melisandre, who is 
Is it Melisandre or Melisandre? Or well, Melisandre? if you're going by the audio book, he goes Melisandre. Yeah, he, he messes me up because <laughs> oh, I, I listen to a okay, lot Okay, speaking of, it. of the audio book, so like I wanted to read the physical book and I did for most of it, but like I ran out of time. So I switched to audio and I was like, mm. oh God, <laughs> because oh, he's well. not good. And he, he says him saying Brian, Brian for, for Brienne. And I'm like, and Pataya. Ugh. I love the way he Hiya says Bailey. Jamie with a with a sh sound. He goes Jamie. Yes, the audiobook's a trip. I, I listen to it oh literally God. because it's funny. I, it's nostalgia for me because like I, I I've listened to him before and it's just like it's like your crazy uncle. And like all yeah. of the Northerners sound like a bad parody of a pirate. It's <laughs> not good. I th I think I said it in Discord. Tyrion sounds like Elmer Fudd. Like it's don't it's ruin this for me. <laughs> Like, there's certain scenes where he's just like he sounds like a little scrunched up curmudgeon. I'm just like, well, what is this voice? Because yeah. all, I'm, of course, all I'm picturing is Pete, you know Peter Dinklage. Yeah, and it's just it's not the same. But yeah, I mean, so you get introduced, and it's it's interesting seeing like the little differences and the subtle changes that they made from like book to show. Of uh, just like the scene of like the poison wine and Melisandre actually being like, you don't have to do this, and then him drinking it and dying horribly um and just like the little subtle changes of like what stannis writes in his letter and mm -hmm. i mean stannis is just i think they did a great job of portraying him on screen because he's just kind of a dick and like yeah he's he's like in line for the throne like it should be his but he's just like yeah like i'm supposed to be on the throne everyone should just obey me now like oh my brother renly screw him he's gonna join me like send the ravens. Everyone's just gonna join me because I'm Stannis. Just like Stannis the man. Is this who Jimmy wants on the throne? Well, listen, I, I this uh, psycho. I'm Team Renly, but when Renly eats the dust, I I'm gonna go with the rightful heir, and and that is Stannis Baratheon. Well, it is kind of amazing how quickly Renly bites the dust. Like they like set it this seemed up way faster, and like they set this up as like these are gonna be the ones, that, and already one is gone. Oh, oh god. Okay, what? Yep. <laughs> Who's left? <laughs> yeah, and you know when we think about. Because obviously we have all the context of the rest of the books and stuff, but if mm -hmm. we really take a step back and we think about this as an individual entry and like when it came out, Stannis was such a big figure in book one that was never on page, but yeah. everyone kept saying, "Oh, Stannis, Stannis," you know, it was like a hard man. And as soon as we meet him, th the fact, like you know, people will tell us someone is hard and cold. I felt the chill through the page whenever Stannis arrives and the way Davos reveres him. You yeah, know, cut off my finger. It's like. Dude, Stannis is, is well, it's also uh, it's interesting kind of that lunatic. we never get any of the anyone that's like a king, we never get their perspective. The only like potential mm -hmm. ruler's perspective you have is Daenerys. But like you don't get Robert, you don't get Stannis, you don't get Rob, you don't yeah. get the kings. You just get people around them to be the eyes on it. That was one of the, the greatest changes I think that the show did though, was because we're always gonna mention, you know, comparing the show to the books. Sorry, there's a show of it? Yeah, right giving you those extra POVs that you don't actually get to see in the books and you know Rob being a super impactful one because like he's out winning all these battles and you're not really seeing any of it you hear a lot of it from like Catelyn mm -hmm. and that's really it and then even like Blackwater as impactful as it is and I know Jimmy loves it uh Aww. is is it's almost it's much less of a focus in a way than it is because like shows always go for like the big spectacle right like well, later on when we get to like hard home like barely is a thing in the books but like it's a huge it's like a full well, it's also it's the, the kind of thing that like it's a rare writer that can write a cinematic battle in a way that mm -hmm. you're not just like head hopping and then bogged down in a description like it's just not a strong suit of books in general yeah, yeah and george actually does not like writing battles um, it's hard to tell. do you can tell there's a lot of like cutaways or just like hey this happened like moving on well just, again it's like it's easy to like show a bunch of different things going on but a book can only tell you about one thing at a time and so like to yeah. try to tell you everything it can that's happening choppy. well see i know you don't like john gwen jimmy and i do and i think he writes battles incredibly well and does that bouncing well we're almost 10 minutes well. in and i'm gonna say joe abercrombie oh, writes oh. battles <laughs> really well <laughs> it is. i actually the as a reader, I don't actually really enjoy battles. Uh, it's it's very few and far between. Um, 
and you know, my channel, I talked about Gwen a lot when I first started out. So people thought I was like really into com like people would say, oh, you're really into like books that have combat. And I'm like, not really, actually. Like if you look at stuff I've read, like the dagger well, and the coin barely has action in it. And it's, I like, feel one of my like favorites. combat adjacent things are really interesting because like, I mean, also uh, Pierce Brown, the way he talks about writing battles, I was like, yeah, you get it. Because he was talking about how like the thing that makes a battle interesting to you, especially in books and film as well. But at least, you know, film can just deliver just spectacle, just things booming and crashing. But yeah. like in a book in particular, like what makes you invested in this battle is the emotional journey that a character is on and how this changes them and how we are, they are, where they are at with this. So like to always have the battle through the lens of how this is affecting the character and not just telling you about things that are like exploding or whatever, but like how this affects their emotional state or like how they're reacting to it. And that's what, that's what you like latch onto in a mm. battle. So, like, I think, uh, I mean, obviously, Abercrombie is, like, known for being a good character-driven writer. So, like, that's obviously his approach to battle. Um, and Are I we going to have to start doing, like, a shots every time you say Joe Abercrombie or first You're love. welcome to. We'd already be at two, so maybe it's not <laughs> the best idea. I think uh, the best battles, um, and, and I think Blackwater falls into this, is whenever yeah. the, like, the battle itself becomes a character almost, uh, especially when you're seeing it from both sides. This This, obviously, we get pretty much... Um, well, we do get Davos, right? So we get Davos and Tyrion, Sansa within Sansa uh, within the uh, <laughs> the keep. Um, but the battle. Well, I mean, itself... he also does a good job of like withholding information without it feeling like you're being cheated. You know what I mean? Because like you yes. get to see Tyrion piecing together his plan for this battle, mm -hmm. so you have glimpses of what he... it's not just like I'm doing a thing and you know nothing about it, but I'm planning it. Like you get to see things he's doing. Like you know he's building a chain. You're not super sure why. You know he's like looking into the wildfire, so like like you're like I can see I guess kind of I, I know it's going to be probably on the water, so you could, in theory, if you know enough about battle tactics, you could start to formulate like what would be his plan. Yeah. But it never actually tells you what his plan is, so that you can be surprised with Davos when he's experiencing the battle and yeah. what the strategy was. The relaying of information is one of the strongest suits of this entire series. Mm -hmm. it, it like he one just the way he reveals, um, like he sprinkles it in like. Uh, the Kings guard right out to meet Yorin. And as the reader with our formation, we think they're after Arya because we don't yeah. know that he's been, they've been sent out to get all the bastards from Robert. Right. Um, and then, but if you're paying attention, you can kind of piece together like, Oh, he's actually here for Gendry. And then we yeah. see the, the scenes later where Tyrion's disgusted by what happened. And then Janice slit gets sent. Out. So like he kind of starts building those scenes way earlier mm -hmm. and we don't have that context. Another thing that he does is, and this happens with the comment. Uh, which is in the prologue, the comet people have different Everyone visions of it, it differently. Yeah. And yeah. everybody sees it at a different time. Yep. And George is really good at that. And then Danny finds out in this book that Roberts died like way after we're like, duh. But yeah. what he does with that sometimes is he will remind the reader of something he wants you to remember. And other authors will just point blank, tell you stuff over and over and over again. And I hate it. But what Gurm does is, uh, Catelyn figures out that her two youngest boys have been murdered mm -hmm. through a raven. So yeah. without someone just going, well, you know that the two boys have been killed. It's like she's finding out and we see her reaction to that event while still being reminded, oh yeah, that's right. Like, they might be dead. So or also, I mean, like when you just mentioned Danny finding out that Robert is dead, like the fact that it makes it without having to say... This remote place always gets news late and may not even get the full story until much later. No, they just show Danny gets this news way later. And at the point she's getting the news, they don't know that Ned is dead. Yeah. They just they're like, yeah. he's been arrested for treason. And like, you know, he he died. He He's definitely yeah. dead. This is I like love Dora's reaction to that, too, because he's like treason. He's like Ned Stark. He's like, there's no way. He's, he's like, like I hate that guy, but he, he didn't do yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, that's kind of like, he's the worst because he'd never <laughs> commit yeah, <right>. treason. <laughs> he's not that cool it's interesting too those so you mentioned like the the king's guard hunting the bastards but like the book it was cersei and like the show again like little subtle changes made it joffrey's decision to do it and making him more of like an outright monster cersei is like way more sinister at this point in the books because like she's really well, I mean, like got her hand we didn't that. talk about this in the Game of Thrones chat, but like the show added in the fact that Cersei had had one of Robert's children and that mm. is not true in the books. So like they did a lot to kind of little a lot of little things to soften Cersei a little bit in the yeah. show. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah they Until definitely. Later. 
and, and yeah, then they just made her stay in at a window <laughs> two and a half seasons made a lot of money <laughs> i mean um, honestly if i was lena hetty i'd be like you just you want me to stand here drinking wine and okay that's it great where's my check <laughs> oh, great doing it too she did a great job um one of the interesting notes that I and, I and and I hope we can come back to this in a feast for crows, um, because I think it plays a bit of a more well, maybe not. We'll see. But maesters are very interesting to me mm -hmm. because they have all this knowledge. They have the citadel. They're clearly not fans of dragons. They're not inter interested in magic. And there's a line in the prologue uh, where essentially the maester says we can heal, but we can, we also can kill. Isn't it's that like, in the prologue? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like, huh? keep that like george didn't just say that in the prologue for no like his prologues are stacked with foreshadowing and all these things literal shadows foreshadowing yes. <laughs> yeah, right? so i mean i think the maesters are up, up to something i think the citadel is one of the more interesting things that's coming in the winds of winter and sam being there um and how all that will play out i'm not sure but the maesters i think in the books are a lot more devious rather than just well, just i mean like anytime you set up like a central place where like knowledge is stored and controlled yeah. like unless you're a hack writer like that is going to be where i mean knowledge is power and so like whether that power is being used for good or evil or for purely selfish things like that's always going to be a center of power for sure yeah. and yeah, I mean, well there is a theory about maesters yeah. yeah which i mean would make sense right because again you know, subtle changes in the show. The only real like kind of crappy person that you're introduced to that's a maester right off the bat is Pycelle. Yeah, that bag like, of shit. Everybody else is kind of like Eamon's cool. He's just, you know, a cuddly old blind man. And you've got Crescent and all these other ones that are like they they're pretty just like Maester Lily almost. And it's really just Pycelle that's kind of garbage. And, and you know, we actually get a little bit of their um I don't I don't want to say like bigotry towards magic, but like their distaste for it. Whenever mm -hmm. Bran is talking about green dreams uh, from Jojen, just write it off. They're yeah. Like, and and Lewin's like, yeah, Lewin's like, that's crap. And yeah. like he, he kind of sounds like a dick. And Lewin so studied lovely. a lot, too, though. So like he knows a lot about it. And he's still which I mean, kind of lends credence to the, you know, keeping magic hidden. Right. Yeah, is that he? Knows but it also, I mean, stuff. it is just very reminiscent of like the real world and how people are like, oh yes, well back in the day, the poor peasants thought that this was magical, but we know now that actually it's science. So like, <laughs> yeah. it's also just reminiscent of that. But when when you mentioned Eamon, like I was just I just started thinking about how like the books, when you in terms of who you meet, the Targaryens actually aren't. I mean, Viserys is just kind of pathetic, yeah. but like Danny and Eamon, um, like. Your your ex actual experience of Targaryens is pretty positive, and it's yeah. only the fact that everybody else, like people like Maesters, talking about the history, or like the when we talk about you know what the Targaryens did when they were in charge, we're talking about who's going to be king now. Mm -hmm. You hear about the Targaryens and you know how mad they were and how like incestuous they were and how awful they were, but the ones you've met that yeah. you spend a lot of time with are Aemon and Danny, and they're fine. <laughs> Aemon's phenomenal. I love Aemon. Tragic backstory. Yeah, and him having the talk with John, like it's such a believable moment. Um, yeah. Well, later and too, Mormont elaborates on that talk yeah. to be like, "Let me give you more context for like him being here." Yeah, yeah. The wall is the wall is such an interesting setting, um, especially with all the history there. I mean, we're talking about scrolls and stuff. I mean, it's it is fairly interesting that there are so many scrolls um, that Sam finds, and it's kind mm -hmm. of a glancing statement, right? Um, but they're there. And I think that him having to take some stuff to the Citadel later, all that, I think it's all going to play in like, what are in those ancient, ancient scrolls? Magic. Sure, sure. Magic. Also the ending of the entire book is foreshadowed in the prologue, uh, which is one of the coolest things George has ever done under the sea. Smoke rises, bubbles and flames burn green, blue and black, more black water Bay foreshadowing. I know, I know, I know pretty cool. Right. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. I just, yeah, I mean, I, we're, we're obviously jumping around a lot, but yeah, I mean, so Sansa, um, hormonally mental the months before her first period. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely something that here, Leanna, I'll pass this to you. It's like, just kidding. Oh. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I am the authority on, on this subject. So, <laughs> just kidding. But yeah, I mean, I, I think he does a great job, which is why Sansa bothers so many people is because she's kind of like an annoying teen character. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, exactly. Like she's well, a she's spoiled also, I mean, little she's princess. She's so young and naive yeah. and 
Yeah, if that's her main. Uh, like us, the prime, reader, like as you know, as much as I'm going to contradict myself because I hate Lyft as a character for being an annoying child character. Like it's understandable in the sense of like this world, especially where she is so naive and doesn't understand it at all. Which I mean, most of the Starks don't seem to, which is why they all die. <laughs> but like. She doesn't know what's going on, and she's so, I want to say dumb, but it's really just naive. She's well, kidding, even, like, I mean, after everything that she's been through, it's kind of like uh, towards the end of Clash of Kings when she's now free of Joffrey, and she's like, oh, I'm free. And they're like, oh, oh, sweet honey child. Yeah, like, Why you do you saying? think that this is actually good news for you? Right? And she's like, what? No. And you're like, you've been through so much. Like, did you really think this was good news? <laughs> I mean, and this, the same thing with like, again, Blackwater, when she's talking to Cersei and Cersei's just like, let me be real with you. Like he's here so that y'all don't get raped. And he's also here to kill us because we're not getting taken prisoner. She's just like, oh. And then she's seeing what being a queen it really is. Yeah. Right. I mean, the sacks of cities and making those awful decisions that that it's kind of force your song. hand. Yeah, and, and Sir Dantos is a further examination of fantasy tropes as well. Yeah. Because uh, the way Sans of, uh, you know, viewed the world, she would have a prince in shining armor, but it's a drunken clown named Sir Dantos. Yeah. And her real savior is a scarred dog in the Hound. Yeah. Well, both of them, because I mean, like, Sir Dantos is also, like, you know, he's trying to help her. And the fact mm -hmm. that in her mind, too, like, when she reflects on how all of those true knights stood by and did nothing, and it was this guy who's not even a true knight. And, like, yep. You know, she's like, he's being more knightly. All the knights in their precious honor. Mm -hmm. And like Tyrion is a lot more like he behaves towards her the way she always imagined someone as beautiful as Joffrey would. Mm -hmm. She's like, oh, he's a kind and chivalrous prince, except he's horrible. Whereas Tyrion shows her chivalry. Yeah. And, you know, of course, she like sneers at it. But we fixed that in first law. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Drink. Um. Bouncing back to the prologue real quick, and then I'll stop mentioning the prologue. Um, <laughs> That's fine. It's a good jumping off point. The morning air was dark with the smoke of burning gods. Oh, what a great opening line. That's is so it like a Oh, is it like a shared universe with RF Kuang? <laughs> <laughs> they foreshadowed book three of her series. Oh my god, you're right. Uh, we also got our first mention of Azura High in the prologue. I mean, that dude, yeah. that prologue is so good. I think that we were talking about it's that. Only, I mean, it's a prologue that, like, it. as like if it was like a pilot, you know, like for a show, yeah. like it like sucks you in. Yeah. Because it's so it's it's so different than in Westeros and like what you're used to seeing like at that point. Because all of a Game of Thrones is focused on like the King's Road and King's Landing and Winterfell, and then you get into this, and it's just like, oh, here's all these other people on an island in the middle of nowhere talking about some like red priestess and fire gods and prophecies and you're just like oh. i mean melisandre comes off the page like she is oh, yeah. kind of presented to us as like a charlatan and evil and which tells me immediately george is going to play with that yep. so is she really evil and in a world where magic isn't supposed to be real and the gods aren't actually acting making a like, comeback yeah she's like doing things that does presumably seem as if her god is real but <laughs> or if not a god she has access to something Yes, but and then you have to wonder, do the gods rely on the existence of dragons? Because the dragons come back, right? The magic starts coming back. We see that with the uh, alchemist guild. Whenever he's saying, you know, we couldn't get our spells to work correctly, but now ever since the comet, we're able to do it faster, which we know mm -hmm. the comet signifies the return of dragons. Yep. Um, and then the maesters say all the magic went out with the drag. It's, it's very interesting. So, like, do the gods only exist if dragons are around but then i mean our white walkers also because like we saw them before dragons were reborn yeah they were the prologue of game of thrones yeah and you know another thing about the white walkers that's i love and it, it's it's disturbing is the fact that um and you know maybe this is i'm this actually might be in a, in a storm of swords um craster's keep was in this book am i right yeah, craster's okay yes yeah. you already I, know about the sacrifices yeah so mm -hmm. He calls them just so gross. The, oh they say the sons are coming. Um, yeah. talking about Craster's sons, like yeah. that is so terrifying. <laughs> like the sons are coming. Uh, I it's it's some of that horror that George likes to write. Uh, and he was well, I mean, very foreboding. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna bring up a uh, first law again. Oh my but god! I think Fourth drink. The things that like that's I why I like things like the Song of Ice and Fire. First law. Um. To, I mean, obviously other series as well, but where like 
it's not that there's no magic, but it's very mm -hmm. low magic. And so yeah. that when magic does happen, it's like it doesn't point. have to be big magic. It's yeah. very little magic that makes you go, what's that mm -hmm. magic? Because it's versus not, like, it's yeah, not like versus a wizard like Marvel that like just like bigger and bigger and bigger. And you're like, yeah. well, this is just absurd versus like a little thing where you're like, I mean, just like Melisandre in the yeah. prologue. It's a tiny thing. It's not like a big explosive magic thing, but it has such bigger impact because this world is so low magic. But yeah, I mean, I would say it, it's definitely low magic and it doesn't focus entirely on the magic itself, but like White Walker is introduced in the prologue. Like that's definitely magical. You have a giant magic ice wall that can't be breached that protects the North from like all these things that everyone thinks are BS, grumpkins. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> You've got, again, another mention in this book, again, of there's a literal wildling giving his sons as tribute to the walkers. And you're, and that's like all you really hear about it. You're just like, what? Cause there's so much less of like a thing in the books. They're just kind of like, Oh yeah, by the way, these things still exist. Like they're literally creating more of them. And then you have actual dragons. And like, once we get to Karth, you get a lot more magic. Again, it's not people like throwing out fireballs. Well, you also like, meet Jack and Hagar who do. is doing some, oh, man. some interesting some parlor tricks magic. at the very least. <laughs> I, do you guys there's ever so uh, much in this book? It, there really we'll is. It. We'll get to it. Do you feel like there's a chance Illyrio being from Bravos is Jack and Hagar? I don't think the timing would man? work. Well, I just I feel like that's the kind of thing that like uh, a cheaper universe, you know, Star Wars where everybody is a secret Skywalker, a secret yeah. pal, but you know, where like it makes the world feel smaller and like in some connections, hmm. some overlap makes it cool and connected. But when everybody is secretly always like connected in somebody else and the relative of, you know what I mean? Like it just condenses everything to something like gimmicky and small. Yeah. You know, like not everyone is secretly somebody else. The only reason <laughs> I don't think so is because we see Illyrio in a Game of Thrones in the dungeons of King's Landing, like talking about you know, when Arya like overhears the conversation about what's happening, but then it's like, then he's also with Danny and Viserys. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm talking then... about Cereal Pharrell. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm Syria. I'm, okay. I, I, I mean, I, I, you I, got the name wrong, but I somehow knew you meant I, I, I wrote it down wrong. <laughs> I, so I know because that's a pretty like big um, theory that Cereal is actually Jack in. Yeah. Because like goes from her, her sword fighter and then dies off screen. Like mm -hmm. he's probably not dead. And then Jacken shows up and is like super impactful to Arya and then gives her the coin to Bravos. And like the only other Bravosi that you've been introduced to is Sirio Pharrell and you never see him again. It's like, I can also see it. If Jack and Hagar is a face of man, what was he doing in the dungeons? Because he could clearly yeah. just get like, He had to be there for he gets a out of everything. Yeah. yeah. They, they just go and, you know, they're kind of like, I mean, they don't really have free will in a way, right? Like they're always on a mission when they're out changing faces. So, if he's not Serial Pharrell, then you have to wonder why was he in the dungeon? Yeah. So um, I can't believe I called him Illyrio. That's why I was confused. But no, see, big fan. I've read that. I like that theory, actually, that it's Serial simply because mm -hmm. I like my theory that Jimmy's a fake fan was confirmed tonight. <laughs> Certainly. I mean, the only other thing that I guess to bring Serial back into Arya's storyline would be her going to Bravos and training with Serial and like him being there, right? Like, what else would yeah. you really do with Sirio if he gets out of King's Landing alive and then like, yeah. reappears later and it's not Jack in? But honestly, I just feel like, you know, it doesn't always have to be that you're introducing somebody who's like secretly somebody else. Like, I think that Sirio, he introduces the concept of Bravos and what the Bravos mm -hmm. are like and so plants that. So it's not just like, oh, this new world that came out of nowhere. Like, we've already gotten a sense of kind of like somebody who's from there she's encountered it before so when we meet jack in then she's like oh like i kind of know about this like i yeah. kind of recognize some of this because introducing jack and he's already such a weird thing to introduce but you now at least like you have like a foothold in like where he's from it's not just like a completely new concept a new part of the map yeah what is a new concept is the faceless man being a thing, though. Because also, we talk about the narrator cool. of the audiobook, the way that he says Valar Morghulis made me want to oh, die. I, I, it I so it. bad. When he said it, I was like, no, it's Valar Morghulis. Stop. Like, don't ever say it like that. Oh, I, here's what happens. I question myself when I hear Roy say things. I'm like, wait, I don't I question a... anything I've ever said when I listen Honestly, to Honestly, I don't even, it's not that I question myself. I question what, I'm like, what is he trying to say? Because I don't know what's really? happening right now. And I should know what's happening because I've read this before and I've seen this show. And then I'm like, I try to like 
write down in my mental paper, sound out what he's saying. I'm like, oh, he's trying to say like Brienne. I honestly didn't know he was trying to say Brienne. Right. I was like, huh? Right. <laughs> and then like context clues. I was like, oh, you mean Brienne? <laughs> I, I like what Derry said. Derry saying that Peter knows how expensive faceless men are. He knows that Ned will be offered the wall. So he knows the dunge, dungeon dregs will soon be given to the wall also. So it, maybe it's possible that Peter would have put Jacken into the dungeons. This is a way of getting around him being serial Pharrell and being in the dungeons. I mean, maybe I could see it. I, I don't think Peter's plan ever in, entailed Ned dying. Actually, I really don't. No, that was kind of a wrench in everyone's plans. No one's plans. plan entailed Ned yeah. dying. Everyone was yeah. like, what the? Everyone was like, yeah. get him out of here. We'll send him to the wall. We'll brainwash Sansa, make her a puppet queen. Oh, you you cut his head off. Um, I mean, like, even, like, the most sinister characters, what's, like what's Cersei and Tywin and Tyrion are like... Uh-huh. I just love the imagery of Varys running across and being, what are you doing? You know, like, what? Because yeah. Varys, Varys never plays his hand. And yeah. he plays his hand. He's like... What in the Because that does not protect danger, the realm. Danger, danger, mayday, mayday. Yeah. <laughs> if you're there to protect the realm, you don't just decapitate the man that you were going to send to the wall. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, because, like, also, it's not just about Ned. Like, you know that, like, the Starks are going to have to, like, have war. go to war. Like, yep. you, that's going to happen. You've just brought that upon yourself when you didn't have to. Which is a great scene that we get with Tyrion, right? Talking about when he comes back to King's Landing. And he's just like, yeah, you guys kind of killed all those talks when you literally cut his head off. Uh, everything's screwed now. Congratulations. And they have Jamie. Like, not good. And when he's like, okay, we still have Sansa and Arya. Like, we still have Sansa. He's like, okay, that's going to be good enough. <laughs> yeah, it's going to have to do. <laughs> oh, man. It's like two sisters. Well, we have Sansa. He's like, yeah. What? It's also interesting that all the way through this book, like everyone either thinks Arya is missing, she's safe mm -hmm. at the castle, or she's dead, and then she's really just roaming through Heron Hall. And Arya's story, I will tell you this: I think that I don't know what's wrong with me, but I never really—I wouldn't say I didn't feel empathy Many for Arya. Things. Well, certainly, uh, but like this read through, I am connecting with Arya way more, and she's so young. Lamy's death, character. yeah, Lamy's death is brutal the march to heron hall is i mean terrible. i thought you said mommy's death and i was like uh, what mommy it is well, it's yet. interesting how much more leeway people give Arya than sansa because Arya does a lot of dumb things because she's a kid she's young yeah. also she's brash, i think it's because yeah. like sansa's a little bit older we're like well she's a grown woman especially by the standards of this world whereas mm -hmm. Arya, i guess people are like she really is a little kid so when she like you know it starts like bragging about you know having a sword and you're like Be quiet. <laughs> she does just as dumb as Sansa when she just like says things not realizing what a bad idea it is to say that. I think it's because of the dynamic of the character. Because Sansa is really just that spoiled princess that like is so naive to the world around her. And all of her, like, she is kind of shitty to Arya and then gets her own wolf killed. And then it's like she still wants to marry Joffrey and be a princess. And it's like she keeps wanting to do that. Like Arya acts out and lashes out. But like you kind of root for her because it's like she's defending. You but know, like in their own ways, they're both survivors friends. in their given context. Because Sansa, sure. like going around with a sword, that wouldn't help her where she is. And yeah. like Arya being like diminutive yeah. wouldn't help where she is. But they're both like adapting, like to be a survivor in their given. Yeah, like, she's a wolf, man. Paradigm. Yeah, and by the way, I love when when her, her and Gendry, which they I think they did word for word, when they're talking and he realizes who she is. Or like, but like right after he tells her to pull her cock out, it's like pull your cock out and take a piss, and then, she, and then he realizes who she is. She's like, "Oh my god, I'm sorry, princess." <laughs> Such a good scene. Um, I I also really enjoy the fact that Arya is also a bit. Uh, I wouldn't even say foreshadowing, but kind of a revelation on who Lyanna Stark was as a person mm -hmm. because we're reminded multiple times in the first book that uh, Ned believes her to be just like his sister Lyanna. Yeah. So this with this context and what we think we know about Rhaegar and Lyanna at this point doesn't really add up if Lyanna was like Arya. Like I don't see her being a damsel in distress. Uh, that's never been Arya yeah, and then I can wasn't. exactly right. So like that's kind of like a really cool parallel that he draws between those two characters and through an Arya POV, we get um, some of the first foreshadowing of red wedding mm -hmm. when Roose Bolton gets a letter from his new Frey wife yeah. and he burns it. We don't know what it says. Right. And then he goes to hunt wolves. Yep. I, 
when I I forgot that line when he's yeah, like, I have to go so hunt good. the wolves. I can't keep. They're keeping me up at night. Oh, you bastard, Roos. So, bastard. so just for my own, because I'm. For, they changed that completely for the show, right? Because yes. they put Ty. uh they put Tywin there, which is phenomenal. I loved that. Yeah, yeah the was, interactions was, between him and Ari, like rereading the, it, I was show. actually looking for that, and I was like, oh yeah, they don't do that in the book. I was kind of hoping that they <laughs> did because I love those scenes between them. But uh, it was I one mean, of the still... times that the change was actually a good idea yeah. for the show. Yeah, I I would actually agree with that. I think I think um, it's pretty. Now you look back, right? It's pretty obvious what George was setting up here with mm -hmm. it being Bruce. Like I see why he did Bruce, but we didn't really lose much um, from it switching to Charles Dan or Tywin yeah. or whatever. So and I do Charles think Dance is Tywin and Tywin is Charles yeah, Dance. Charles Dance is the goat. Yeah absolute goat yeah but Arya's story just really bleak man and well, really, also i mean like the me. reading the books like i remember just thinking like as they went on that i mean well brand stuff is also bizarre but just thinking that Arya's mm -hmm. plot line gets the most bizarre and the most where like i don't know where that's going or what like i have no point of reference no other story to be like well this is kind of following the trajectory of or oh this is an interesting subversion of the trajectory i'm just like i don't know what is happening with that at all well you know think about like kids going on a magical journey and some wizard takes them away and gives them a special coin and they go yeah. and it's like you know, it's Harry Potter walking to hogwarts into the wall to hogwarts but instead of that she's being trained as a faceless man, uh, that well, I guess is... I meant so. Like once, like that, yeah. Like, like I mean, get what we get in this book. Then once she gets Good there point. and like her training begins, I just remember every time I got to an Arya chapter, I was like, I don't know what's gonna happen here. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I I feel like you can say that about Bran too, though, because especially oh, sure. like in this book, like meeting Jojen and Mira and just talking about the green dreams and Jojen immediately just being like, I know exactly what you're seeing because I see it too. And Bran's just like, no, this is stupid. Like, this is all a dream. This is all fake. And he's just like, Bran, like, listen to me. This is what's happening. And you start to see those, like, visions of, like, the water crashing on Winterfell and all this stuff that, like, he doesn't understand yet. And then... And then we really started thinking about him being a warg for the first yeah. time. Like, it being real. Um, because it hasn't really happened yet, as far as, like... Yeah. Like, has it? No, no. It, well, it's visions, right? So we don't yeah. know if it's true or not. And, and it's one of those things where you can use that as like a means to further the story and what he's feeling inside. Da, 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 da. But George is straight up telling us with Jojen, like, nah, fam, it's real. Yep. <laughs> like, sh sh shit's getting weird in Westeros. And Bran's chapter. Well, I think also the fact that, I mean, as you said, the theory. prologue, like being so strong, like the prologue. Just like the prologue in Game of Thrones sets up that every time people talk about White Walkers, that this is not a joke, that they're making fun of it. But you've mm. seen in the prologue that they're for real. And so similarly here with this prologue, we saw what Melisande could do. We yeah. know that weird, weird stuff is possible. Yeah. So then every time things are happening and there's doubt thrown out by other characters like, oh, that's not real. Or like, you might think that's what's going on. But you saw there's weird shit going on. So you're like, no, I think it's real. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's also starting to take over the, the townsfolk and such because the comet, the comet is such a big, yeah. a big thing. And people are, what's it mean to different cultures, which is also another really great way of like building out your world without yeah. telling me shit. Um, you know, Oh, you see the comet, it means this and that. And so even that is kind of a signal and you can feel there's like some, you know, there, there's almost like a, a buzz around yeah. flea bottom and, and Winterfell and all these places and our main characters who are a little higher born think it's all silly you know and and they're going to be and too yet, rich to even care. they will each in turn look at the comment and be like well I mean it, it, is it kind of low key like a, a personal sign yeah like me? I'm going to win the war yeah uh, one Bunch thing I, pompous arrogant rich people <laughs> who think the whole world is the comment is for me I mean Man, you can draw some parallels to our world with that yep. shit. Um, one thing I want to bring up about Bran that I, I really loved, and I think it could be uh, uh, the beginnings, maybe, of Bran having a higher purpose, uh, even past being just like the three-eyed raven mm -hmm. or um, crow or whatever. Right. Yeah, well, it's uh, to, win, to win the Game of Thrones. I, I think... He has um, the best story. <laughs> uh, Lewin, who I love, by the way, yeah. is... Uh, it, the early chapters with him and Bran, the they fill out the rest of the North and all the vassals. 
that's how we get introduced to the car starks yes um, manderley's and all this stuff and it's because lewin is teaching bran how to be the leader of the house and it shows like the north is super huge like it's massive yeah. way bigger than i thought from game of yeah. thrones and it establishes all the houses and the reputations in the politics while also showing us that bran has like a natural affinity for solving problems because he's catching yeah. on very quickly and um and lewin's training him so that's a pretty good catalyst, I think, for the future of maybe what will happen with Bran. And then at the end of the book, he basically says something about like talking about the king sitting in their crypts. And even though, uh, you know, it's the Winterfell has been crippled, like mm -hmm. it's still there. It's yeah. still alive. And so is he. And it's like interesting. He mentioned the kings in the crypt. Yeah. Very and being crippled. Yeah. It's really. Bran the broken. Bran. <laughs> What's you? You also get some of the like Bear Island and some of the the rest of that from Jora because you know he's reminiscing kind of about like his whole tragic backstory. Yeah, but, I mean you, you get a lot of that fleshed out as well just from his POV, which I don't remember. I think they kind well, of I mean, like, from the show. Going back to like how good Jora Jora Martin is at giving you information without giving you information, like just having some central points of knowledge mm -hmm. that like everybody's going to have an opinion on, and so then you don't have to say that these people tend towards this worldview. You can yeah. just show them reacting to a thing that everybody's reacting to, like the comet. Or like news of Robert's Your death, is messed up or whatever. Tree. I know, but um, just giving them the opportunity to react to something that you already know about, so you don't need to know about this thing. But seeing how different people in different parts of the world react to a thing, how they interpret it, or what they have to say about it when it comes up, shows you what you need to know about them as characters or that part of the world. Yeah, for sure. Winterfell is the crypts, not the castle. Yeah, Derry, that's that's a that's a good point. Um, I was thinking about when Bran was in the uh, the crypts, mm -hmm. and in the subsequent chapter, a couple chapters uh, uh, ahead, John and Ingrid talk about um, they talk about Bale the Bard, uh, and Bale the Bard uh, had scaled the wall, went down the King's Road, um, acted as if he was a bard and tricked everyone, and Lord Stark asked Bell what he wanted as a reward because he was so impressed with his skills. He requested only the most beautiful flower bl blooming in Winterfell's gardens, the blue winter roses. And in th the same book, Danny sees a blue rose at the wall of ice. Yup. <laughs> Go. It's absolutely goaded. Are you kidding? This is why he hasn't written the winner yet, because he got five books in and was like, I created so much shit that I got confused. And this is also one of those things like, you know, people point to other authors, this person writes a book a year and it's like, they're not doing this. Like yeah. they're, and it's just, and it's not, it's just true. It's they're, they're just not doing it like this. And some people will look at this and they say, <laughs> That's what I would always say about Name of the Wind when people were talking about like, why can't he be more like Brandon Sanderson? And I'm like, because quality over quantity. <laughs> well, this is totally different approach to telling your story, right? Like, um, and, and both are valid and fine and, and people can like whichever one they want. And, and some people look at this stuff and they say, I don't care about Bell the Bard. I just want to know what happens. But for me, this is the stuff that I i love like I well i mean it's also like the kind of stuff that like even if you're not sitting there puzzling things together it's stuff like that that's subconsciously because it's kind of generally around there's just subconsciously this sense of there's just like layers to this world and it makes it feel real yeah 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 the i think we talked <laughs> about like, this last time wow. <laughs> about man's being in winterfell i think we talked about that last live stream yeah yeah and that and that kind of goes with bail the bard um, which draws some really interesting parallels to another person who really liked to sing named Rhaegar, but I do not believe Mance is Rhaegar. I used to, but I do not anymore. I don't think Rhaegar can be alive for the story That'd to work. That'd be kind of silly. Yeah, it can't work. And Leanna, you actually said something very, uh, like, I like that. Every, if everything's connected, it makes the world smaller. That's actually a really good point. But and, also some of it's just, like, not believable. Yeah, Rhaegar has to, has to be dead. Because it's it's the kickstart to the series, and it's Prince Charming losing the battle for the yeah. girl. It, it has to he has to be dead. I, I don't I don't I used to really like it because if you actually look at the way Mance is described in the books, mm -hmm. it's like very similar to Rhaegar. Like there's like a Rhaegar lot of, went out in the woods and just got grizzly. Yeah, and like 
you know, would he look different? Um, you know, George does put that across that people don't know what people look like. They only hear the names and the legends. Like, so I think misidentity is a real thing in this world. Well, I think it also, I mean, it's the kind of thing where you throw <laughs> off, throw out enough like things where even if that's not the plan, where sometimes someone is secretly somebody, but most of the time, probably not. And so you're always just going to be like keyed into like, well, is this one? Is this one? Is this one? Is this one? And like, if everybody is, well, that's honestly, frankly, boring. So like, yeah. but like sometimes it is. And so then like always be just like on alert for like, oh, does he look like that? Could it be that? But like, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> so Robert is charming. I mean, Robert is a charmer in my book, but Jimmy maybe... prefers blondes. Yeah, it's just what it is. And bards. <laughs> So let's jump back. So some minor things that again like changes. Davos has like seven kids in the book. Dude, dude's fertile. He's got one <laughs> in the show and he dies. Yeah. He, I think he loses a couple of kids, right? At Blackwater. I'm pretty think, sure. Yeah. Even though and also, I mean, I love the actor they chose for him. And I just so I mean, I thought he was he got the vibe right, but he's actually yeah. described as looking quite different from I mean, several of them are. I mean, you have Jorah, who's like handsome as hell on the show, and he's supposed to be like this creepy old man that wants a 13 year old. Like, yeah, uh, Master Peter Simp. Dinklage. Little sus. Master Simp. Um, yeah. yeah, Davos is like the true good guy, man. He really is. You know, we hear that he, he might have been unfaithful back in his day, but like he seems like a guy that's trying to turn good and do the right thing. And well, I love that also, like, Davos, instead of again telling us, that Stannis is gruff, but also he is like, you know, his more like there's a reason people are loyal to him. Like instead of telling you all that, just having Davos, his experience, his personal connection, like, that to tells you a lot yeah. about Stannis without you yeah. actually being told about Stannis. Yeah, absolutely. And, and here's a question about Stannis while, while we mentioned Stannis. And this is something I hadn't known, but I've seen people talk about this and I, I don't I don't know um, what the justification for this is. But some people believe that Stannis is representation of autism, um, that he's on the spectrum. Um, Alan mentioned this. I Noel's in the chat. Noel also mentioned this. And then the more I looked into it, a lot of people feel like that is true. Um, is it maybe have, because he latches onto things and like doesn't quite understand, like, yeah, that he can't just have it the way that he believes it should be? Yeah, the that in in his um, kind of like yes or no attitude i mean i i don't know too much about it so i don't i mean it would make sense for like if i'm talking with alan um, we're talking about stannis (laughs) this whole time i was thinking davos and i was like how is i don't get it how is davos (laughs) no he just missed (laughs) it i'm with you now and i see it definitely hearing alan say that makes sense because if you know alan he says that like he can't let things go and like Mm -hmm. he he hates certain like people abusing power and like you can see a lot of that in stannis of like he's the rightful king everyone should just like fall in line and do that and like he yeah. can't comprehend of right. like yeah. he can't comprehend the people like not falling in line with that so i mean i, I could definitely see some of where that's where that's coming from for sure but yeah. so then i guess also the question is like it's even if the result of how he's represented is that it's it could very easily be interpreted that way do we think george meant it to be interpreted that way yeah, hard to uh-huh. say. I feel like it wasn't as prevalent uh, when he wrote these, but George is also a pretty thoughtful guy. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love to ask him that question, actually. That, I, I, that'd be one of my, if I ever it was had accidental the representation or intentional representation. Yeah, it makes you wonder. Now, I, you know, people say Stannis is very cut and dry, and it's true. But if you look at Davos, you know, like Davos is a very good example of like instead of beheading him, like maybe Davos I mean, is one of the exceptions. Stannis is also kind of like the less likable f- further extension of the type of thing that Ned is. Like he's just like one step further because Ned is very like, this is the right way to do it. This is the wrong way to do it. And we do only what is right. And so then like Stannis is like even further and is like no negotiating and he's not even pleasant about and it. He's, he's cold to his daughter. He's cold yeah. to his wife. So like Ned was like soft and like would still, you know, like show affection and like have a softer way of expressing himself. But his like at his core, he's like, no, what there is right and there is wrong. And I'm not bending all that. But like he would say it in a way that was like trying to be nicer and convince you or soften the blow. Whereas Stannis is the same in the core as like as Ned is, but he's not going to soften it. He's like, this is right. This is wrong. Don't care. (laughs) Yeah, it's like Ned could be soft as snow or as like chill as ice. It, it, like it depended on the situation and he would vary it depending. I think Catlin actually talks about that quite a few times. Like 
the distinction between the two and how he could switch and how she like whenever his eyes went to ice, she knew like he meant business. And Stannis does not have that, Let's at least so get far. Down to business. business. <laughs> I love Alan. What a guy. What a guy. My wife's like loves... you to know that that song was not written by Alan and <laughs> what that song was. Oh, <laughs> I'm still amazed Disney hasn't come after his channel. Oh, it's coming. And my, my wife's favorite movie is uh, Mulan. So every time I watch Alan's video, she loves it. She's like, oh, is he going to do the thing? I'm like, yeah, he's going to. Yes, of course he is. He's doing the thing. So jumping back to because um, we haven't talked too much about Tyrion yet. When oh, he gets back to King's Tyrion. Landing and he uh, just like dresses down Janos. Uh, Slint. Slint. That piece it's of shit. So good. Oh, it's and so he just, like gets him drunk off his ass and he just like thinks that he's praising him. And he's just talking shit the whole time. He's just like, oh, you'll enjoy the wall. He's just like, what? I have friends at court, you little imp bastard. He's just like, mm, keep talking. It's fine. And he doesn't want to call him Lord. I mean, Janice Lynn is a great A douche. Oh, yeah. He's terrible. Knowing what a big fan of these books Joe Abercrombie is. <laughs> I, get the guy poured a drink. I just, I cannot. Like the whole time I was reading Clash of Kings, Tyrion's plot line is so reminiscent of Glockta's plotline in Before They Are Hanged that like he shows up and is taking charge of the situation, taking charge of defense of the city, trying to figure out who's up to what and questioning everybody and like planting little schemes to try to figure that out. He himself is physically like not able to do things, but he's smart so he can try to follow that up and and suss that out while also pre preparing for war. I was like, honestly, like, I, I mean, I love Abercrombie and I am not saying he's plagiarizing it, but I was like, we're, is... Before they were hanged, your version of Clash of Kings. <laughs> uh, I mean, maybe, maybe, right? Um, and you I mean, know, there's a lot of that in it. Both are vilified uh, and and hated for the position they're in, for the status that they hold, being crippled. and also for their physical like yes deformities. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, a cool thing that I wrote down here is that through Catelyn, we're not allowed them. to think that you what you wrote down is cool. Oh, well, I thought George, what George wrote down was cool. And in turn, I thought it would be cool for me to write about his coolness. Um, Catelyn, we talks about Heron Hall's past and the history of it and that it's cursed. Yeah. And the very next chapter, Tyrion chapter, where he sends Janice Slint to the wall, who is the holder of Heron Hall at the time, therefore reaffirming the fact that it could be cursed. <laughs> it's interesting. Like anybody that holds Heron Hall has bad luck, right? And the next chapter, Janice Slint. Loses Heron Hall, gets sent to the wall. It's a nice little thing, and also Heron Hall is like one of my favorite like settings. It's so and cool, war pieces. It's so good. And then Littlefinger gets it later, but Littlefinger through Tyrion's eyes becomes way more interesting to me because he respects Littlefinger's scheming, but at multiple points he actually admits that he fears Littlefinger. Like not just thinks he's cunning and like sly, but he's like, I'm like legitimately worried about this guy and I want to cut him down. I want to get rid of him. He thinks about killing him at one point, but yeah. he just keeps getting distracted and distracted and distracted. And I think it's an indication of how important uh little finger will be down the line. I really Definitely. do. That's why I love the, for what the show did with his character and Varys is actually getting to see so much of their Certainly. scheming and their conversations that you just don't, see in the books at all unless it's through someone else's eyes because they're not povs which is very unfortunate and again excellent casting for both of them of certainly course. i love yeah. the tires casting god damn it <laughs> um what do you guys think about cersei and Tyrion's relationship it's toxic it's so rough to read at some points when Tyrion's like genuinely trying to bridge the gap. And, and well, I mean, the saddest does. is when she shows him physical affection and he's like, oh, okay, she's up to something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> like, she that's is. so sad. That, is. Like, that's all it takes for you to know she's up to something. It never, he never questions it. it, never enters his mind that, like, oh, this genuine affection is like, uh, oh, and, and you something. see Tyrion, it bothers Tyrion. Like, it runs deep. How the, and it's, I don't even want to say it's a hatred. It's, it's, um, he feels like it's a betrayal. Like mm -hmm. we're supposed to be family. That's what dad <laughs> teaches. And because they don't consider him family. He's like an embarrassment on their name. Well, I think yeah. it also like having, cause you, you really don't see much of Jamie at all, even though he's my favorite <clears throat> character. Like you don't see him until way later in the series. And I think that like having seen so much of Tyrion and Cersei, it makes it so much sweeter because by itself, like Jamie and Tyrion, like it's a pretty good relationship, but it's the fact that you're juxtaposing it in your mind with Tyrion's relationship with Cersei that you're like, <gasps> 
how precious, how sweet, how wonderful. He actually loves his brother. Because you don't get a lot of, because in the books, it's like they whispering wood happens and Jamie's captured. And then yeah. you learn that he's captured, and then like you get the scene with him and Cat instead fantastic of fantastic conversation instead of him and Rob Catelyn. because mm-hmm. Rob's not there. But like, you well, don't if it get happened with Rob, we wouldn't have seen it because they're not exactly either of them as POV. <laughs> again, like that's another change that I liked, like having Rob sort of confront Jamie. But all, I mean, Cat doing it with Brienne there was outstanding. And yeah, just, but I mean the 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 brother sister dynamic of like really the only time you see Cersei like actually get upset is when Tyrion's trying to like ship her kids away and you see her actually kind of like break down. Well, I love that bit. too. That moment when Tyrion is like just thinking to himself because Joffrey's being Joffrey mm-hmm. and he's like, does she really not like, is she really blind to what Joffrey is or does she yeah. know and not care where he's just like wondering to himself and not that it really matters, but in terms of how she behaves, like ultimately, like it does, you don't need to know because how yeah. she behaves, it will be di- no different regardless. But when he's just like, does she really not see it or does she see it? And she doesn't care. And also yeah. kind of breaks his heart that like, she actually believes that he's enough of a monster that he just like wants the worst for her children. And well, it's interesting because like, it's also like the realization also on some level that you're like, well, she thinks that because she's projecting because yeah. that proves to me that that yeah. is what she thinks that yeah. like that's that's what she would do. Yeah. And I think it's also uh, evident and it lays the groundwork and, and some and I see this all the time and I think it's from just show watchers mainly mainly they say oh, Cersei's just so smart and devious and she's not she's not Tywin. She wants to be Tywin. But she, yeah, she tells her that. Yeah, she's a dunce. Um, and she's like cocky. That's the biggest downfall. Like she doesn't have the humility to wonder if she might be wrong. She's like, and she I'm smarter anxiety. than all of y'all, and I would be running the world if I had a penis. And you're like, well. And I think she she has anxiety. And I think a lot of that probably comes from the trauma of of uh Robert. And on top of that, probably trying to hide her and Jamie's relationship from her father. Mm-hmm. I think that probably really impacts her as a character. And one of the best pieces of the whole time, uh, whole like dynamic between her and Tyrion is when Tyrion out schemes her and finds out Pycelle's leaking information. And then, yeah. Pi- I mean, I hate Pycelle. And we find out that he let the gates open yeah. and all this stuff whenever Ares was on the throne. Like, we get so much good stuff from their interactions that go much further than just you know, brother and sister hating each other. Well, I mean, and we get our first glimpse of Jamie, how he really feels about what he did and the reputation he has for it, which like later gets much more developed. But like we get our first taste of like Jamie, like he can be all glib and Jamie, but he like you can like even in that little conversation, you can see how much it irks him what people mm-hmm. say about him he's yes. like he's very above it all and very easy and very glib and he'll just like be like fuck you but when it comes to that he's like <laughs> here's kingslayer and he's just like <laughs> yeah this is i actually have this in big but i said the beginning of jamie's arc this is yeah. actually the beginning because we finally hear his side of the story when he's talking and the, like you said the catlin conversation is a plus we get all the backstories of mad king's betrayal uh and we get the inkling oh, that yeah, and we get the inkling that Jamie, while he has done bad things, is vilified for some of the wrong reasons. And mm-hmm. it, it, he he didn't ignore the king's madness. And Gerald Hightower, who everyone says is such an honorable, amazing knight, has you know a couple stood pages. That he stood there and he said, "We are not the judge of the king. We yep. are here to protect him." Yep. And this is somewhere. This is a part like part where Ned was too cold steel. You know, Ned hated Jamie for that, yeah. um, but it, like he saw him burn your your brother and your father. You know what I mean? Like I, I Jamie, uh, it's weird that somehow George can make him sympathetic, but he did. Yeah, it's. Wild. I mean, but also even as terrible as what he did, you know, shoving a child out of a window, yeah. he straight up. Well, was I mean, about it, like, it. he's like what he does. I would do him. anything to protect my family so yeah he was like i pushed him out the window i hope that he would have died he didn't that sucks but (laughs) But i feel like what he does by first showing us ned and where like most you know or maybe not most now at this point but you know like back in the day the way fantasies were written doing things honor for honor's sake is always the right answer and it leads to good things and that's what you're supposed to do and then doing the dishonorable thing is what the villains do and by showing us Ned's arc, where he's the honorable one, and he's the one that does what's right, and where did that get? Not just him, not just like, well, I got you killed. It got the whole of like the continent 
at war and your children in danger. And it was just a bad idea all around versus Jamie, who does the dishonorable thing, but it's probably the smart thing and saves people by doing it. And just like establishing that like honor for honor's sake is not a good thing. Dude, that that's a good point. That's a great parallel to draw from those two. I hadn't, I'd never thought of that, but you're right. (laughs) Well, Jamie's my favorite characters. I thought about Jamie a lot. I mean, we need to finish it, but like Jamie has the potential to be like possibly my favorite arc in like fiction. Like I, I, I love Jamie. Him and Shivers. <laughs> Shivers, my boy. Unless, well, George. That's the jury's still does. out. The jury's still out. We don't know. Well, in a I show, act- they shafted it. <laughs> I'm just gonna let you guys know if it goes circular, I have no issues with it. I actually don't mind. Um, I don't if see they that build happen. him up that much though to that degree of like he's actually willing to go and fight whites at winterfell and then he's like "Ah, i gotta go back to cersei well well, his entire arc is going to be different in the books as Tyrion's is as well because of the conversation they have before Tyrion flees king's landing where they changed one sentence in the show that whole sentence matters so much for where they end up post uh, a storm of swords and we'll get to that you know whenever we read it or whatever but i think it's going to be much different but I don't necessarily think it's impossible that it could be a circular arc. I, I definitely don't. And as an Abercrombie fan, eh, uh, I like circular arcs. So um, as long as they're done proper. So last argument at King still pissed me off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we talked about uh, the Lannisters when uh, I just wanted to mark that Joffrey at his name day mm-hmm. when he makes fun of Tommen. Makes me so mad. Because Joffrey's such a little asshole. His chubby little legs were pumping. That's what it said about Tom. I was like, that is adorable, dude. Well, so just everything about Tom and all the time. Just like, he, I just honestly picture in the <laughs> Disney animated how little Michael looks and how little <laughs> Michael is. And he's like, I want to fight pirates too. And you're like, yeah. oh, that's so cute. I love <laughs> and Marcella's cheering him on. And you're like, oh, look at this. Like, this is a good family. And then mm-hmm. you got Joffrey. And he's just a dick. Such a dick. Tommen just wants to joust, man. He yeah, just wants and, to have some fun. And he says, he, and uh, you know, um, he says he doesn't want to let Tommen joust, saying that, uh, and says following his mother's commands are for kids. And Tommen just, uh, and Marcella looks at Joffrey. We are kids. Like, we are kids. <laughs> and yeah, doofus. And it kind of like makes you want. It's like, man, was Joffrey like just born evil? Pretty much. Because Robert didn't seem like he interacted with the other two kids, right? So maybe it just impacts kids differently. I don't know. But like that we are kids, I think that was very on purpose to kind of remind you that, hey, Joffrey's like 13. Mm-hmm. Well, how old are Tommen and Marcella? At- uh, uh, Tommen's like five. He's young, young. Then, I mean, maybe it's just showing just how, I don't know, because Joffrey's been pampered for longer, and he's been kind of told that the sun shines on his ass longer than the other kids have so maybe yeah. he just it went straight to his head yeah and but, I mean, he's, but i mean the thing with joffrey is it's not it's not just being selfish it's not just being you know no, thinking like the, the sun rises and sets for you he takes pleasure from oh, pain yeah. and that doesn't yeah, come from people. being pampered yeah there's a screw loose there for sure Almost and he like didn't get bad. much nurture so um where he got over nurtured yeah, maybe Robert well, wasn't a mom. good father because he's not his father. Wait, what? <laughs> what? Excuse oh, me. Oh, you subscribed to that philosophy? No, <laughs> You've been listening to gossip. As I drink my uh what is this called? Lagavulin. Lagavulin. I just honestly, you're such like I cannot drink Lagavulin. Yeah. I oh, yeah, I'm struggling. Not. I'm eating coal over here. It's rough. I'd forgotten about that because it's definitely not on the show <laughs> that he does yeah. that it's rough um when we were talking about Tyrion and like him prepping for plans one of my favorite moments of that is whenever he's talking to varus on the wall uh of king's landing and he says uh i am all that stands between people who hate uh who hate me uh hate the little monkey demon and stannis <laughs> i'm the only person that stands between them and stannis and i think that this is again going to be the case down the road this is kind of like a, i guess a prediction or something but i feel like Tyrion at another point is going to stand between a foe and King's Landing, and next time he's not going to defend them. Uh, whether that's Danny burning the city or whether it's something else, 
I think the that White that yeah, it, it could even be that. Like, I really think Tyrion's going to come for vengeance. Will Tyrion's plan be to hide in the crypts? No, <laughs> no, absolutely not. And really he bad. also talks to Cersei, and he says, "I don't." Whenever he the you know the horror is captured and everything, he says, "You will. It'll like have ashes in your mouth." He's like, "I will hurt you." And some people think him like the whole Joffrey thing, but we have to remember like Joffrey wasn't killed by Tyrion. So we mm-hmm. haven't yet seen that come up and that he promises Cersei, which is why I think he, I think his exact words are whenever you think that you're hidden away and you're safe, I will like, it'll burn like ashes in your mouth or he something. Said, like I will hurt you for this. I don't know how yet, but give me time. A day will come when you think yourself safe and happy and suddenly your joy will turn to ashes in your mouth and you'll know that that is paid. Yes. And so I, good. my, I, my prediction is that she will flee to Casterly Rock and he will burn Castle Rock. I think that will happen. But it's a rock. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, he's right. <laughs> also, there's wildfire in the dragon pit, folks. Yeah. We get that foreshadowing here. So, I mean, and... well, because eventually, because Tyrion and Danny still, I mean, this book six, I guess, they still haven't met. Eight. So, yeah. I mean, it'll likely be that. Well, we know that as soon as Tyrion meets Danny, he becomes stupid. So I don't look forward to that. <laughs> and by stupid, you mean evil. And the show didn't want to make Peter Dinklage a bad guy. That's exactly what happened. Which is why Partly. they cut. That's why they cut the line with Jamie and Tyrion. I think. I think that that's why they did. They were like, we cannot take Tyrion down Which a bad line? guy role. The fact that Tyrion admits, he says to Jamie, "I did kill Joffrey," and in the show, oh, yeah. he doesn't. That is such a huge change. It's yeah. such a big change. Um, and it really actually spoils Jamie and Tyrion's reunion in a lot of ways too. Got rid of like a huge pillar of their um, conflict. Just, yeah. You know, eh, oh well. I mean, whether or not Tyrion outright kills Cersei at some point, though, it's like she's kind of setting herself up to fail because I think well, I mean, we all said it earlier. Promise like, for revenge isn't in her dying; it's in her living to see some kind of her entire family arm. die. Yeah. yeah, but like Noel said it earlier, if if Cersei had any sense. She would have put Joffrey in his place a long time ago, which is yeah. true, because she just lets that shit run wild. She sure does. And like she has no. Which is why I mean, I think that's why Tyrion is like, does she really not see it? Like, <laughs> and she won't even defend Tyrion at all, even from people in the council talking yeah. down to him. You know, it's right, like but I mean, like defend. Else. He's like, he doesn't expect her to defend him, but like Joffrey yeah. is like bad for the country and honestly bad for Cersei because he puts her in danger by being stupid. And you're like, do you really not see it? <laughs> Yeah. They got rid of the admission about Taisha causing Tyrion's pain. That admission was screwed. Yeah, yeah, and that's also they, played they, with. Again, they changed it a little bit. Right? Yeah, the Taisha story is different. Yeah, because yeah. the show made it strictly that he got played and then like the knights trained her basically in front of him and then that was it. There's yeah. like, more to it than that. Yeah. All right, where are we going next? Let's talk about Theon. Oh, we haven't mentioned Theon yet, dude. He's he's a textbook narcissist. But also, he's what so... a great introduction to Asha. He's the worst. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it kind of uh-huh. depends on your your definition. That's what you're into. I mean, great. Which... I mean, it's another example of like some a, a worse author would just tell us a bunch of things about how tricksy and badass she is. But mm-hmm. just the fact that she does that to Theon, that tells you everything you need to know about what she's capable of and who she is and it what the Iron Islands are like. It tells you a lot about him because she says it straight up. It's just like, I wanted to see what kind of man you were. And now I know. Yeah. And he can't handle that. And yeah. that's something that will continue to happen with Theon. He is unable to face the decisions that he makes and see. So every time they talked about Reek, I was like, but he's oh wait. Yeah, no. right. It's <laughs> different. <laughs> um so what about the part where Theon climaxes when thinking of himself during sex? <laughs> I know you like that. Dude, when I read that, I was like, I read it twice. I was like, excuse me? And then I listened to Roy say because it, it was creepy and I thought it was funny. <laughs> Um, it, but he, he does this like multiple times where like, it's a textbook, like sociopathic, narcissistic. He's so obsessed with himself. And yeah. Like, and he, like, he shows understand. up the Pike and he's just like, yeah, I'm like, I'm going to rule this place one day. And it's like, bro, you've been gone for 10 years. Like who do you, you don't mean shit here. Dude, when that Balon moment... tells me dresses like a whore, I laugh so, so good. But that moment when he's telling Asha, which he doesn't know is Asha, 
why because she's like well aren't there brothers you know of the, so uh, that could also inherit and he's like well he's been away so yeah. they wouldn't and she's right? like he's like well i've been away but he's no, like the carrion doesn't want the throne and he's he's off playing games out on his boat and you're on this crazy and like it's like i'm i'm next in line and then his dad's just like yeah she's actually ironborn and like doing everything that i'm asking and you're just this little bitch in a costume like, <laughs> he's like did you he's like what did you pay for that like the iron price or gold he's just like gold gold and he keeps like, calling rips it off of him. So oh good. it's so good and, and it, it, he doesn't understand when he takes winterfell and he's putting people down and he, you know he's he's sacked it he's murdering people he legit can't comprehend that people are mad at him that he grew up right with. he's like like what did you expect me to do, it's man? Like, I had to Winterfell, and they're well. just like, "Fuck you." <laughs> yeah, he's just and, like, what? And he actually has that internal thought where he says, "I saved like Bran's life with an arrow. Am I gonna have to take it as well?" And he like he feels justified in that, and you're just like, yeah. "God, Dion is such a sack of garbage." Yeah. Well, it's the fact that I mean, it's it's also quite tragic because you're like, I mean, he's it's not. I mean, it's sort of like the Joffrey thing where like you were born a little off, but like the fact that even if he was, you know, a smarter or nicer person. <laughs> He isn't one of the North. Like he's not. That's not his yeah, people. And also, the Iron home. Islands would disown him, even if he was, you know, the type of yeah. person that was savvy and could figure out a situation. They would still reject him. So he is like landless. He is houseless. He is it's like absolutely in limbo. tragic. But then it's like at a certain point, you got to pick. Like I, I would say he chooses wrong. But it's like he tries to just make this triumphant comeback to his his family. But his family didn't care about him to begin with. Like they let him get taken. And they did not welcome him with open arms and seeing the kind of person that he was like, you get to experience that with him as like, I've made a huge mistake. Yeah. He re- like he starts to realize that and it is sad, but at the same time, you're just like, God, this guy sucks so much. And he has those dreams in Winterfell. And I love how George uses dreams, but he uses dreams with Theon and he's surrounded by dead people. Mm-hmm. And Rob comes in with, sto- uh, in with, uh, with Grey Wind yeah. and they're all stabbed up. And it really bothers him. Um, so then he like calls in the girl and like has sex with her until he falls asleep or some madness, you know, because he's a Chad. But as one does, yeah, yeah, you know, what, what can you do? Uh, you know, running Winterfell's is not easy, folks. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I love that, and like you're seeing him process the grief, and it's like, and, uh, to give Theon just a slight bit of credit, and by credit I mean an excuse. He's like sixteen. Um, yeah. So he is young. He has and like Leanna John said, he, is 14. So true. Yeah. I mean, he definitely did not have a, a real upbringing. I mean, it's hard. And he obviously, is, well, I mean, I think, well, this is also so like, uh, so I was saying, so like Ned and Jamie, you know, interesting mm-hmm. counterpoints. You have John and Theon. They were both displaced. Neither of them has like a place. Neither of them has a house. Neither of them could really claim their families because of the different reasons, but how John reacts to that situation, which is yeah. how Theon reacts to that situation is very different. Yeah. Um, do you, do you feel like the Miller kid, the Miller's wife kids are his or whose are Theon's because he talks, he says the Miller's wife, he said, Oh, I've laid with her a time or two. And if you look at how old they were, which are Brandon Rickon's They're age, young, it yeah. could line up. And he and he says, you know, I lay with her a time or two. I don't think we'll ever get any confirmation of that, but I like to think that it's his. it could be, but like I don't think you'll get payoff unless Theon realizes. Wait a minute, if, isn't Bran eight years old? Theon is sixteen. He'd have to be eight years old when he. How old? here? Let's look. At, uh, actually, I, I need to that math that. doesn't check out. Yeah, <laughs> well, you might be right. Let's see, Theon's age in Clash of Kings. Oh, he's no, he's he's nineteen. Okay, so. And and wait, how old is Brand? Is Brand eight? Is Brand yeah, eight? Yeah, Brand is eight. Brand is eight for like the entire series. <laughs> <laughs> he's Benjamin Button. He just doesn't age though. Um, but yeah, even the, if he's nineteen, Brand is eight. So if he this kid is eight, Brand's age, he are they though? Eleven I they were younger. Let's see. I don't know. I thought they were younger, but either way, it's like if that was, he would never know, right? Yeah, and and we will never find out. This Slash, is, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, uh, to be fair, I think he was nine, actually. Bram was nine. So I think that you're actually right, Leanna. I don't think it could. One of them maybe could have been Theon's kid. And I don't think it's necessarily important. It's definitely fun headcanon to make it more tragic, right? But like, these are one of those things that like George never has to answer, ever. Yeah, for sure. And it's just fun to think about. Um, yeah, it looks like people are saying, yeah, 19. Arya was eight. 
I thought Bran was six. I think Bran is a little older than six. I think I, Bran might be eight at like the end of the like a storm of swords. My 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 Google search said he was nine, but I don't I don't know if that's factual. But so I mean that's that's another thing of like the age being an issue Wait, in the book. They books. said his age in this book. I remember. I'm sure they he do, was talking about how he just turned because he was complaining about how he's like you know, I love that this age. He had his little aerial moment of like, I'm 16 years old. I'm Noelle's sure. saying Bran is seven and Arya is nine. That's that sounds right. The reason it's going to be an issue though is like, granted, everybody's a little bit young for like the kind of power and position they're in, but <laughs> a storm of swords, like he's not. Is he? T is he nine? At, by the end of that, is he ten? Like to get. Well, but I to, think he's eight in this book. But to get to like where, seven. assuming that it follows loosely what the show does, like unless there is a time jump that Gurm still ends up writing into the books, like it's going to be kind of hard to to get to some of this with how they're so young. I but. think, yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, and I, I actually think we should talk about this when we get to a feast for crows, um, mm -hmm. because I, I want to sit down and really think about like the five year gap. Cause I, I, I my gut feeling is that it's Gurm's biggest mistake, not doing not it. Do it, but, or then just to have them be older yeah so maybe actually the bigger mistake is the age but here's the thing like these kids are going through horrible shit so like why can't they be a king you know like why not it's fantasy you know i i think yeah well also the fact that i mean in the historical time period that he's drawing from like people did inherit power at those that's ages. true mm -hmm. that's true and and maybe a little bit of reality got too mixed in with this story because of the show right because like they had yeah. to make it digestible um, so maybe it's not actually that big of a deal, but I think it's interesting that George himself said he wanted to age the characters. Yeah. Um, and, and I think we should maybe, I think it'd be fun if, if we looked at like some of the interviews where he talks about it and stuff when we do feast, uh, and then see how that impacts feast. Because I think that when you look at what um, he you had, you are not allowed to assign us homework. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's due. Okay. <laughs> It's not for a couple months. It's fine. Yeah, I'm giving you plenty of heads up. I don't. You don't have like resources. Months. Yeah. Jeez, oh, Pete's. Um, but uh, then just... Alex has to finish all the first law books so he gets all my references. I wish. I wish he would. I know Shivers is a character. I know what first law. I know who Joe. <laughs> I know is. Shivers is a character. I will he... read more first law. He had a wonderful so interview on this you. channel called Lana's Library once. Everyone should go watch it. It was very who? good. Some some booktuber. I don't know. She hates everything. Oh, I know that. I meant the <laughs> author. I've never heard of him. Oh, <laughs> Joanna Conda? I'm more famous than Joe Abercrombie to you, Alex. <laughs> I well, like this. Yeah. Well, of course. Come on now. I mean, I do um, have the crown in this thumbnail. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, Noelle yeah. says Sabran is now eight and Arya ten. Okay. Yeah, they're too young in general. Anyway, so, I mean, Theon, though, after he takes Winterfell, again, a little bit of a show change of, like, Winterfell... And then we're like there to defend it. And Ramsey and the Boltons come up and they're just like, oh, like you're here to help. And then they just kind of slaughter everybody. Also casting for Ramsey. Very, Tremendous. very good casting. It's cool that we saw the Roose Bolton foreshadowing the chapter yeah. before that happened, too. So That's again, where he gets the wolves, letter. You know, they yep. take over Winterfell. And then, you know, Ramsey, or well, because he was Reed, right? And then he walks up to, to Theon and like bitch slaps him and knocks him out. It's so good. Yeah, and um, um, what's uh, I'm I'm blanking on um, oh god, Sir Roderick. Yeah, Sir Roderick, rip, dead. Oh yeah, it's brutal. It's absolutely brutal. Um, did you guys catch whenever Arya is with Roose and uh, the little Walter Frey boy? I think his name's actually Walter, but the little Frey boy's crying. Many of all their names, Walter. <laughs> yeah, for real. When one in doubt, Walter. One of them's crying, and he said, "Like I have to marry someone else now." And she's like, "What are you talking about?" And he's like, "I was supposed to marry a princess." They were talking about Arya, and she's yeah. right there. It's so good. I loved it. Uh, Calm down, Jimmy. I know this is like little stuff like that that I'll reread these books ten more times before I die, unless if it's like yeah. next week. But one of the so speaking of Arya, because we can just segue back to her. It's like when they're on the King's Road, right before um, they get attacked, when she's asleep and she hears because like they keep hearing wolves. And she hears like a bunch of wolves and wakes up, and that's like when the attack happens. Mm -hmm. this, again, it's like you're you're constantly getting this like interaction with wolves, and like you you learn about. Well, I don't think it straight up says that it's Nymeria, but like you know the wolf pack is like a thing. Like Nymeria is leading like 
dozens if not hundreds of wolves like across the country hunting and like they did a terrible payoff of that in the show but it's like that's already mentioned in the books that like that's a thing that's happening and her name when she's asked it she panics and she says uh she says nymeria she and says they call her name yep dude so, nymeria is such a dope name by the way definitely gonna be my next pet's name for sure i mean it's better than shaggy dog shaggy dog is so well, Rickon, bad Rickon kind of sucks anyway, Rickon so. sucks okay <laughs> Rickon is a child. Fuck Rickon. Rickon sucks. Okay. <laughs> Rickon is the spunkier Tommen. I shouldn't swear on your channel, Alex. I'm sorry. We've already sworn so many I'm gonna times. I was like, oh, Alex I never swears. Right, <laughs> I don't care. Um, so we're talking about the kids. Why don't we talk about mom? Why don't we talk about Catelyn? Who is Catelyn's the... boring. <laughs> she's uh, sure, but she's the motor in the story of Clash of Kings. She's the motor. She goes and sees. She introduces Brienne. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Brian. Also that, I mean, I obviously remembered that Brienne becomes very loyal to Catelyn, but I honestly forgot why. Like, I forgot the exact moment because where Brienne Renly's is like, dead. I, right. And so then I was like, oh yeah, oh That's yeah. <laughs> and and I mean, her it, flashing it back to Ned. Roughly similarly in the show. Dude, whenever they bring Ned's bones, <sighs> that was rough, huh? Yeah. Sorry, did you cry? Uh, no, but man, it, it did it did, it did hit me because I was just thinking about how tragic would that be if like yeah. the person you love is laid off for and he she just says these are just bones these are not this is not Ned and then we get a little piece and it's one line Ice isn't with him. Uh, are we gonna start this nonsense? Well, no, I'm just saying like no, this I'm talking about. Uh, oh, wonderful people! Chat. Yeah. <laughs> um. No, keep going. I'm just going to okay. start banning people when they do dumb shit because it's a live stream on my channel, so there's got to be these goofballs. Well, they can't take away from the fact that Ice isn't <laughs> with Ned's body. And yeah. you just think, if, if you if you chalk that away, you say, well, where is it? Who has it? For sure. Um, you also, like, it. what? But we know who has it. Who has it? Ice? Mm hmm What's his name in King's Landing? Ilian Payne. Ilian Payne, yeah. Yeah, but it, I feel like it, yeah, well, we know that, right? But she. I mean, like, it's not a mystery. <laughs> no, 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 it, it's not. But it, This it's one we the, know the answer to. Right, we do know the answer to. Oh, you are Sansa correct. sees it, right? Yeah, Sansa sees yeah. it, and she's like, why does he have ice? But I think that it's interesting for the fact that he mentions it there, and Catelyn doesn't know who has it, and she doesn't know the tragedy that the guy who beheaded has ice and all this stuff. And I think that tells you that, oh, like, where is ice going to end up? Uh, even though it's with Ilian Payne, there's a pr pretty good chance that, you know, it's going to go somewhere. It's a Valyrian steel sword, so I yeah. doubt that. I was going to mean, gonna keep it. just speaking of that, I, it's another instance of George R. R. Martin doing a great job of just trickling in information in a way that you're probably yeah. going to remember it without ever telling you that you need to remember it. That Valyrian yeah. steel, and also then uh, what's it called? What do they call obsidian? Uh, Dragonglass. Dragonglass, like those things, like the way that they get brought up in ways that you notice them without mm -hmm. anyone being like, this is important. Notice it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he also uses, um, Catelyn as a, as a motor to foreshadow a lot of things. And Derry said this in our last live stream in the chat. She said that like Catelyn Stark's instincts are great and it's true. Uh, she's mother knows best. Like George wrote her that way. And yeah. she is the whole time. Theon's doing stuff. Even whenever he's not being a dick, she's like, I don't like Theon. <laughs> she's like i you shouldn't send theon to the iron islands is a bad idea and guess what it was a bad idea well the thing is though like because we have seen at least a little bit of theon and our experience as a reader of theon you're kind of like yeah catelyn like i'm with you like why <laughs> no <laughs> don't send theon i mean even if you had like even if you thought he was going to be a good guy like that that probably is the worst like envoy you could send is like here's the guy that we took from you the guy Let's that has troubled loyalties at best <laughs> like yeah literally but send anybody else <laughs> if we think catelyn has good instincts is she right about Jon snow what do you mean right about Jon snow she hates him so should we also be sus uh, but i mean like having him? instincts about theon she's got no personal wrong. reason to ha to hate that's, theon I mean, yeah, she I does have like any rational personal reason to hate john mm -hmm. yeah i'm trying to rile up the uh catelyn haters that's all I mean, she's kind of hateful anyway, and that's why she comes back. Yeah, she's brutal, especially to John. And like, 
dude john is one of the most tragic characters i've read and it didn't really settle on me until this read through of clash of kings because he abandons rob right because yeah. of the duty that was a result of a rash decision that he made to join mm -hmm. the night's watch which wasn't what he expected and then at the end of clash of kings he has to kill half hand out of duty again and because he let the girl live right ingrid yeah. live and it's a repeating pattern for him of bad decisions like him trying to do the right thing and just being naive too yeah and just being naive um like in a lot of ways this, he had this image of the the wall and like being this like right but then he almost has like movement. the that a mirror of himself in samuel tarley because like when sam wants yeah. to save gilly and john's like why would you send her to me what mm -hmm. am i supposed to do about this because he's like <laughs> now i'm sad about this because yeah i also would like to help her but guess what we can't so stop it <laughs> yeah you know he's kind he, he's kind of it's interesting because you know I don't believe that he's Ned's son, but he does embody Ned kind of after Ned's gone of just fumbling the bag, man. Like, yeah. It, and it's tough because John doesn't really belong anywhere either. Kind of like Theon in a lot of ways. And every Except, time. Except I don't think Ned would lie and dishonor himself and then to pretend to join the wildlings. Ned would be like, but he lied really and dishonored himself would... <laughs> for John. Yeah. But yeah. But <laughs> Ned would die in the cave. If it was Ned and Half Hand, Ned would be like, and he'd be like, oh, "No, you man. kill me, then." I yeah, you're right. You. I don't stand down for wildlings, and then would die. Yeah. <laughs> so. Do you, uh, do you all think Half Hand is uh, Arthur Dane? That's Who? like a big, big theory. Like Arthur Dane, the the he was at Sword Tower of, of Joy. Yeah, but Sword of the Morning. So I haven't read. There, there's a lot of theories that I've Wait, read. Wait, but also, like, what difference does it make if he is? It doesn't. It's just for fun. <laughs> well, there's, here's the thing, though. You know how here's long the... it's been since the books came out? Every theory has come <laughs> true and gone. Well, the <laughs> interesting thing about Half Hand is that people talked about how Arthur Dane was extraordinarily talented with his other hand. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, you know, if his dominant hand was gone, he would, and Corn Half Hand's still a phenomenal fighter. But mm -hmm. if you go back and read all the John chapters from The Clash of yeah. Kings, there's tons of Dorn phrases. Uh, the stars were falling through the night and welcoming the morning, like just just stuff like that. It's really Dornish. Yeah. Um, now, some people say, hey, that's that's a foreshadowing for John. I don't think it is. Um, it's fun to think about. Maybe it's a red herring, like maybe George wanted to layer it a little bit and like throw people off. It's probably possible. But um, I wonder. So like what the theory behind that is that just one of those where it's like, hey, that would be kind of cool if if that was Arthur yeah. Dean or like would it actually well. Be Nobody thinks it makes any sense that Helen Reed and Ned Stark and whoever else beat Corn Halfhand in Tower of Joy. Yeah. So what did Corn Halfhand do? Did he stand down? Did he say, "I'll take the black and just go to the wall"? And this is one of those things where he could get away from f for like people knowing him because mm -hmm. people just don't recognize people. They just don't know what they yeah. look like. Um, they don't have Facebook in Westeros yet. So. Hopefully they'll never have Westeros. That'll be the true brand end. setting up internet as we speak. But, <laughs> but so what, what Derry just said about John uh, deliberately trying to be like, then that messing him up. I mean, I just honestly, like all of his kids in their own ways are working through the legacy that like the life training that they got from Ned mm -hmm. and how not like all of them are ill prepared for the world because Ned trained them to think the world is the way that Ned wants the world to be. And yeah. so like Rob, the way that he operates on in battle, Arya has a quick like, learning curve Sansa has a quick learning curve like them yeah. realizing the world is not what Ned said it was and it hurts yeah. all of them until they finally come to grips with that and accept that the world is not that way yeah in a lot of ways that that train of thought works in the north and that also establishes but the also works if you're the one in charge which Ned was yes. he could make the world what he wanted it to be but if you're not in well, charge I mean the north is its own thing so like when and obviously the, the scene book to show is a little bit different. Like the demands that Rob sends to King's Landing are different. But like when he's laying down the like, I'll release a prisoner every year or whatever, if you release my sisters. And like, he has this whole thing of like, here's the set of circumstances and then we'll have peace. Like we're going to do our own thing. It's like, he actually kind of thinks that like that could happen. And everyone is just like, they're not going to go for this. Like they're the Lannisters, yeah. they're terrible. Well, I was gonna say, I mean, the fact that, like, okay, so the approach to this kind of negotiation, Rob is gonna 
this is what my plan would be. I think everyone could win. Here's a legitimate proposal. Versus the other side is like, what do we propose that could we could like stretch time, make a game out of this? How do we trick them into this? Like they're not genuinely putting forth a proposal I think anyone should or would yeah. accept. So they yeah. are already approach it as a game versus like the North is like, here's how it will be. Here's what we mean. We say what we mean. We mean what we say. And like yeah. no one else is operating like that. Yeah, I mean, look at uh, the car starks and, and every I mean, they're all just so absolutely ridiculous. Like they're not quite barbarians, you know, because that's the wildlings, but they're real close. They're really, really close. They're somewhat civilized barbarians. Yep. Uh, Baba, absolutely agree with you. I think House of Undying is one of the best chapters. In yes, we barely Nintendo. we haven't really talked about Danny. I already have. I, I have it pulled up. We're going to go through every vision. <laughs> we're going <laughs> to do, do the whole damn thing. So five of those six pages are just a deconstruction of the <laughs> vision. True. Just a copy and paste. All right. Uh, so then let's let's branch over to Danny then. So they're walking through the desert forever. <laughs> and unlike the show, uh, is it Ago or which which one comes back with his head I, cut off? I don't whichever one of the uh Dothraki like that doesn't happen and the 13 actually come out to greet them like outside of Karth like immediately um and then that's when we get a lot of the like weird stuff that starts happening in this book like magical weird mysterious like we meet Quake da yeah Danny's uh, much better in this book yes much much better so start with some notes what what do you, what do you got well first off Karth is one of the best uh, settings in all of fantasy. Uh, George describes it magnificent, like Danny walking through and seeing the artwork of all the naked people. And then mm -hmm. she's like chastising herself. But she goes, I've seen men tortured and killed. Why can't I look at someone sucking on a nipple? Like, it's not yeah. that big of a deal. The greatest me. city that ever was or will be. Yeah. And you kind of get this grandioso, like majestic feeling whenever she's talking about Karth. Uh, so I thought that George did. a. I mean, he's the best. I I think he's the best at landscape. I think hey, he Alex, do you think books. Jimmy's a fan of George R. R. Martin? <laughs> no. All right, folks. <laughs> um, and then we also meet Quaif, right? Yep. Which is a shadow buyer from a shy, which is very interesting. Um, and then we have the House of the Undying, uh, which we can break down. And I'd love to hear you guys. So before we do the House of the Undying. We can break down like Jimmy hasn't let's, already. So times. let's talk about Karth before we get to the House of the Undying. So just like the Warlocks being a thing this grand city in the middle of effing nowhere yeah has all these wealth and riches and food and it feels like know, a mirage almost doesn't it right and yeah you got, like zorenzo daxos like just promising to marry her and like hey you can come stay in my house i can fit all of you and it's literally just like the biggest <laughs> house so ever like can house hundreds of people and and they just came from like slumming it in the deserts with <laughs> nothing to eat or drink yeah, and you you get this feeling that like there's some sort of like you know you have all these riches and all this art and stuff, and then like you start hearing oh there's boy servants and things, and mm -hmm. you're just like it's a little creepy, like it's 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 a little it's a tad uh, uncomfortable. Something off. Yeah, and Jorah is on edge the whole time. Yeah, of Jorah is not happy. I was gonna say Jorah is on edge at all times, all the time. <laughs> not just <laughs> he's just extra on edge. And also, like, I love warlocks, by the way. Like, I'm just so into warlocks. Anytime yeah. they're in any book, I love Why? it. I don't know. It's just something about the name. I know that sounds ridiculous. I was about to say, is it because they combine war and hair? And those are your yeah. favorite things? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How'd you know? <laughs> but Pyat Pri is so creepy. And uh, mm -hmm. I w the show did very well. Pyat Pri oh, yeah. is disturbing. He was rightfully show. disturbing. In that. So disturbing. I believe he was a warlock. Like, I want to know, what does that guy do for, like, every day? Does he go to 7-Eleven like that? Probably. I mean, he's an actor. He probably has somebody to go to 7-Eleven. He's hideous. <laughs> so brutal. So um, let's talk about Quaith then real quick before we get to the Warlock shenanigans. Yeah, like, I don't know. Uh, that That's obviously something that they completely abandoned in the show, and we know yeah. that. But, like, I think, and Quaith shows up later in the books in A Dance with Dragons, uh, I think that Quaith's one of the more interesting questions that we have left. Why does she wear a mask? Why yeah, and then weird? I can't remember the uh, there's a theory about who she is, and I can't remember exactly uh, who it was. So I'm failing terribly wow. at that. Um, and I'm trying to pull up more notes. I mean, the I fact like that she comes from a shy is pretty dope. She also tells like she warns Danny to like be suspicious of everyone. Yeah, everyone. 
Just I was gonna say the same everybody. advice Littlefinger gave Ned. Well, he did warn him not to trust him. Or anyone. He's, yeah, but he straight up said, like, trusting me is, or he's like, not trusting me is the best thing that you've done since you've been here or whatever. Mm-hmm. I told you not to trust me. Um, also, uh, Quaith touches Daenerys' wrist and her wrist tingles after. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was also kind of interesting. Um, Cause why, why did that happen? And then she just disappears. She's just gone. Yeah. Um, and then she uh, told Danny that she must pass beneath the shadow and that it'll, that she would find truth in a shy. So I wonder if we'll see a shy in the books. Good. I mean, we won't because no other books will ever be published. Lanny, <laughs> get that pessimistic shit out of you. <laughs> George is doing media right now, guys. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, so like just because I'm looking up some of her quotes and like prophecy that she says it's like to go north, you must journey south. To reach the west, you must go east. To go forward, you must go back. And to touch the light, you must pass beneath the shadow. It's like, what? Yeah, they shall come down. Alice night. in Wonderland. <laughs> <laughs> well, shall last fire made flesh, fire is power. Yeah, she basically insinuates everyone's going to want something for her. Um, mm-hmm. And then, obviously, in the Dance of Dragons, she talks about the glass candles burning, with all tied to the Citadel, and to, to get so layered later. Dance of Dragons, I think we're gonna have a, a blast talking about it. I'm so excited. Yeah, so Are you apparently... not having a blast talking about Game of Thrones? And I'm of having, Kings? I'm having a, a smashing time talking. There's class. there's several theories of who Quaith is, but I guess one of the more popular ones is actually from Fire and Blood, that she's Alyssa Farman. But I haven't even read Fire and Blood, so I don't understand that. We're going to, though. Yes, we are. Uh, the Song dear... of Ice and Fire read along will never end. <laughs> I'm fine with this. Neither one. will a Song of Ice and Fire. <laughs> God That's damn it. Uh, Shiera Seastar um, herself says Dairy. And I think that's the name I was looking for. Daughter of Blood Raven. Yeah. There's some sort of like a shy tie yeah. to his daughter and all that craziness. Um, speaking of Blood Raven, uh, I wanted to note that in one of John's chapters, uh, mm-hmm. they actually talk about uh, Makar and Arion and Aegon and Darion, which yeah. is all like stuff we actually end up getting in Dunkin' Egg, which is pretty badass. Like George clearly had those thought out prior to to when he wrote them, which is really cool. Well, I mean, okay, so like that's the thing too. Like, so some books really feel like the author has built this world and has thought of all this history, and now whether it fits in here or not, they want to cram it down your throat because gosh darn it, they thought of this magic system and they thought of this history and you're going to get told it. Whereas George R. R. Martin, like he thought of all of this so he can draw on it if and when he needs to. But if he yeah. doesn't need to, if it doesn't suit the scene, if it doesn't suit the plot. You could take it or leave it. You could drop <laughs> it. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I agree. All right. So. How's it? House of the Undying Time? Yes. All right. And go. <laughs> All right. So she goes in the house and Undying. We're in the long hall. She passes many rooms containing visions before she reaches the chambers. Don't of forget the to breathe, Jimmy. The visions include, and this is part one, and then we have 16 other ones after these six. Um, number one, a beautiful naked woman ravished by four little men who resemble the dwarf servitor who gives her the um, um, shades. Uh, I can't remember the um, whatever. Hey, Yes, thank you. Um, and it turns her lips blue and all that stuff. So there's a woman being ravished by four little men. A lot of people are they I drinking think, spice. <laughs> I don't think they are. A lot of people feel like this is the War of the Five Kings with Renly dead. There's only four. Um, I think that's probably correct. The woman being Westeros, being fought over and sought after, or her being the woman and the other kings. Yes. What do you guys think about if it was Marjorie Tyrell? If the woman in the vision is Marjorie? Yeah, with four men on her. So she's already had Renly. Renly. So then she has Joffrey. Joffrey. Then she has Tommen. And mm-hmm. I believe that she will then have young Griff, which will then lead to her beheading. Good. I think she's a stand in for Anne Boleyn in the story. Um, uh, that's a good point. Yeah. Drawing that parallel. And since yeah. young Griff wasn't a thing in the show, I mean, that's. It's a book only thing. Wait, what's but my... I mean, Anne Boleyn didn't go through husbands. It was Henry VIII that no, went through wives. Well, the, no, the decapitation would be oh, okay. the... Because the, they even mar- remark about how Marjorie's neck is very thin, and George is very big into that time period in history. Yeah. Um. So that that's... Her neck of... is thin, so it's easier for cutting. Yeah, exactly. 
that's so, what you meant, right? I don't think it's Marjorie in the vision, but I think it's interesting to think about. Like that's like hmm, maybe. Um, well, but, also because I mean, are these visions meant to be for Danny? In which case, why does she need to see? Or she's just well, Marjorie. Well, it's, I, is, do you think there's any? So part of that vision it says they have rat-like faces. Yeah. I, I was kind of fixated on that as well. What the hell does I, that mean? I don't know the significance of rats. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if that is historically, does that mean something? Well, plague. Uh, ooh. Hmm. And I think the, uh, there's going to be a plague of grayscale. I, I kind of believe that in a lot of ways. Um, Coming from who, though? <laughs> Noel just said, damn, Jimmy, I'm, 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 too drunk for this uh <laughs> um and uh liana to answer your question i don't think all these pertain to danny because the red wedding is foreshadowed here which has nothing to do with her really um so i think that we could take these and kind of run with them if we wanted to but let's be honest the woman's probably westeros with the four kings i was gonna say i mean like the yeah because like the woman being westeros and the four kings like that affects danny because like this is the political map that she's yeah, been playing true. with similarly the red wedding took one of those kings off the board that affects danny so like but it being marjorie uh, not so much yeah and well i think maybe there's the young griff tie-in but i don't know if george even knew young griff existed at this point because by by this book he was still writing a trilogy Mm -hmm. like his outline still existed can you so. imagine like just one more book after this just he, he wanted to end it at the red wedding which is banana sandwich but like just yeah. to show you that everything sucks and this world's terrible and there's <laughs> if you think this have, has a happy ending you haven't been paying attention i, I would and that just ends i would have loved it then at the red wedding would have been pretty amazing don't lie jimmy because you want more oh i always want more I so you would not, don't tell me you'd have been happy if it ended after three books. No, you're right. And I actually think that there's a lot of really good shit in the last two as well. Yeah. All right. So, so next next vision. All right. <laughs> a, um, a feast of slaughtered corpses holding cups, spoons, and food with a dead man with a wolf's head sitting on a throne wearing an iron crown, apparently foreshadowing the Red Wedding. That one's like the most obvious one, right? Yeah. Well, you know, the first time I read it, I didn't see it. I was like, oh. Well, I mean, obviously. I was like, was that mean like, you know, Rickon's gonna be king because he's a. I I I just didn't. I don't know. I'm an idiot. Uh, obviously, as, as uh, I read more and more, I I figured it out. Hindsight is twenty twenty. I mean, I'm, if you're just reading this book for the first time and there is no book three or TV show, you're probably at most thinking, okay, like a Stark is gonna die at some kind of feast. Not. Which not what actually happens. Which, again, if we take this as an individual book released in what 1998 or whatever it was, like. Yeah pretty crazy that he had this flat like flattened yeah. out you know I, I don't think i don't think we give enough credence to that because we know the story uh but if you're someone who goes in this blind i mean this is insane i mean we said it on the game of thrones chat it's like there's so much in it that you're just like oh my god he's a madman like, also i mean like we were, like i was saying in the chat when we were just talking about this book just like how many from little to big how much like this series is a master class in planting and payoff yep because like so many yeah. people mess that up where like they didn't plant anything. So then when you try to have payoff, like it's mm -hmm. not satisfying. You're like, why isn't it satisfying? It's epic. You're like, because you didn't plant anything for me to then want to see yeah. payoff for. And the other way around as well, where like they'll plant a bunch of stuff, but then never follow it up because they didn't really have a plan for a payoff. Um, so it's absolutely masterclass. And like, again, little things where like a little comment gets paid off later in that scene, just in terms of like a con a dialogue, you know, where that joke comes back into mm -hmm, it. And mm -hmm. like, it makes, you know, the, that's what makes it the dialogue so rich often, but then big things like, you know, visions being planted where you don't know what they mean. And they may not pay off even in that same book. Yeah. There's, there's no, it's not hurried. It's not like plant it. And the next chapter pay off. Cause that yeah. makes it feel cheap. And that makes it feel like, Oh, you tell me things. So immediately they're going to pay, get paid off. And so it's, yeah, and what he does on the micro is he thematically connects a lot of his chapters. Um, mm -hmm. Erickson does that as well, and it's it's like one of my favorite things. Her, uh, Frank Herbert does it too, yeah. uh, which is probably where George got the uh, motivation from, I would assume. Um, so the third vision, mm -hmm. Daenerys, and this is interesting, and I don't really understand all the stuff that goes around this, but Daenerys' childhood house with the Red Door and Bravos, along with Sir William Derry. There's a scene that also later that comes up. Um, number four, a throne room with a, with dragon skulls on the walls where a king resembling Ares to Targaryen II sits on a barbed throne and appears to give the order to burn the Red Keep during the sack of King's Landing. 
that's pretty self-explanatory. Yep. Um, a room where a silver-haired man, presumably Rhaegar, yep. is with a woman and a baby. The man names his son Aegon and says the child is the prince that was promised and then plays a harp, which is interesting because Aegon died. Yep. Supposedly. You know, this is actually, and you know, us. I never did this. I just took it for truth that the kid died. But if young Griff is not a false flag, that means that he's the prince who was promised. Like now that I'm thinking about it, like we are all take everyone thinks that fake uh, it's Fagon, right? Aegon, it's yeah. fake Aegon. Yep. But now that I'm sitting here and it's like, why did Rhaegar think Aegon was the one? And I remember, you know, if you remember, he says there has to be three heads to the dragon, which mm -hmm. is where John comes in. Um, hmm. That's interesting. Well, you know, let us know what you decide. <laughs> no, I'm curious. Like, what do you guys think? Like, do you think, do you think that that means that Aegon is actually like the second child is the most important? But I mean, but just going off of, I mean, Rhaegar is not an expert on, you know what I mean? Like, he, why would he yeah. know any better? Like, any p parent thinks their child is special. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. And also, I, I have to wonder, like, where and why there had to be three heads to the dragon. Like, if you just had the Prince of His Promise, why do you need a third? You know what I mean? Yeah. That's so interesting. God, stop it. Quit making fun of me, Leah. <laughs> I just love how many times in A Song of Ice and Fire Live, your mind gets blown by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most self filating shit ever. You just sit there like, so this thing, and then, oh, wow. And you're, you're just like, have fun by yourself. Well, if you, t if you, if you take away the things that we uh, assume are correct, right? Because mm -hmm. we don't have the, all the published books. R plus L equals J. Yeah, which, I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty on board with that. Like, I'm 99% sure that's true. But this brings up a lot of questions about young Griff. Um, man, I can't remember. But I mean, well, so, then you can play the game of if it got taken out of the show, is it because it's going to amount to nothing and it's a red herring all along? I would lean more towards it would get too, too confusing in the show because yeah. then they they literally changed Asha's name to Yara because they didn't want people to get confused with Osha. Like, and also, I, I think they think TV watchers are real dumb, which is why they streamlined the hell out of this. Did which you... is also why I think George is taking so long to write it because he's probably trying to figure out how the hell to map this all and tie it up yeah it's not an easy task at all and did you see the article that came out um where it said that george apparently flew to new york seasons yeah and yeah. apparently uh, i had heard the number was 13 but if his agent says 10 he I said it the first uh, he had said early on that he wanted 13 seasons because he thought so there was long. enough material i mean that's insane like, that's so long even 10 is a lot um but i mean they did eight and they cut the last two down to basically one season they yeah, could have yeah. done 10 yeah, and HBO offered him the contract, and they turned it down, which is a, on brand uh, for those chuckleheads. Um, all right, I'll move on here. Let's see. Oh, number six. So a splendor of wizards who falsely claim to be the undying of Karth and offer to teach Daenerys the secret speech of dragonkind. I don't know if this really means much. Like, I, I don't... If it does, I have no idea what it means. Like, not Zero. Um, the only thing that's interesting is to teach her a secret speech of the dragon kind alludes that there is a way to speak to dragons mm -hmm. and a huge difference between the show and the books is Daenerys is not in control of her dragons in the books. She is not like herding them around and have all this control. They're very much more feral in the books than they are yeah. in the show. Um, there's not like that telepathic thing going on there. Um, so after reaching the gloomy chamber of the undying ones, Daenerys is also shown and then cue this, the death of her brother Viserys, which we saw a mm -hmm. number two, a tall Lord with copper skin and silver gold hair beneath a banner of a fiery style and burning uh, with the burning city in the background. Uh, we believe that this is probably what Rago would have been if he had been born, right? He was the stallion, the mouth of the world. He probably would have been burning um, cities and all those pleasant things. Uh, Number three is a dying prince, uh, which I assume is Rhaegar, mutters a woman's name with his last breaths. Ruby's Liana. flying from his chest. Liana, right? It, or was it Daenerys? Why would it be Daenerys? Why not? Because why would why what? <laughs> well, they all, I, yeah, I don't I don't think it actually is Daenerys. I'm, I'm It'd be Liana. Yeah, it's it's Liana for sure. 
which which is interesting because that means that they really were in love so like i, I guess we. I, I totally buy into the whole like they were actually in love they had a kid it was john like i that i that is cemented in my brain is like i can't see it being anything else yeah liana is not one to be taken victim i think she's the knight of the laughing tree like i think she's a badass i i don't see her being a damsel in distress at all yeah i really don't um Number four, a blue-eyed king who casts no shadow raises a red sword in his hand. Stannis. What is he? Does he have blue eyes? So he uh, he has blue eyes, and I think I've always wondered about the no shadow. But I was gonna say, why couldn't it also be? Like, I mean, I know that's not in the books, that's in the show, the but Night something king. similar to the Night King, yeah. Certainly, yeah. Actually, that's a good point. But why would he have a red? I mean, they make such a big deal about the blue eyes of the White Walkers. Yeah. But what about the red sword? Because like we see Sans get a flaming sword in the prologue, and I took the no shadow. I, I've 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 thought about this a lot, and I think the I think no shadow signifies that he's a fake, that he's not real. But there's also the all the playing with shadows and the like the fact that you can manipulate shadows. So the not having of a shadow does that signifies mm. some kind of like melisandre style magic that's actually a good point too because she comes from the shadow uh of a shy right so yeah that's an she interesting one birth shadow so who's to say she can't take stannis's shadow away from him and do something with it yeah and it is you know is stannis more um is he less human with her around in the magic that he's doing um there's that a theory that would be so weird like it would be kind of dope, but at the same time, I'd be like, "How?" I would not put it past George for the the others to be the good guys at the end of the story. <laughs> By the way, it seems like a George thing to do. Um, I mean, I definitely don't think that they're just going to be what they were in the show. No, that's that's probably the biggest discretion of yeah. what exists in both is is the others. I would say because I, I definitely want them to have like a purpose and not just. Being yeah. a bunch of zombies that like swarm Winterfell and die. die and they kill percent. all of the Dothraki except for none of the Dothraki. Exactly. Do you, know, uh, I, do, do I you all think King's Landing to be covered in ice and have the night, the Night King or the Great Other, whatever we want to call him in the book, sitting on the Iron Throne at some point? Do you all think that it. there will be a Night King in the books? To me, Something it's a very like I, there's got to be some kind of like leader. In some form or fashion of them, right? You know who I think it is? Euron. Ran. I think it's Euron. How though? Well, it would be sick because he's kind of like the... a wizard, like <laughs> weirdo. But he he's gonna get the horn in the books. Yeah. And he's gonna blow the horn to bring down the wall. I definitely see that happening. Yeah. I, I, I we'll see. I, I don't know how much that the need. It, I guess for that to work, for him to be like in charge of them though it would mean that either the horn controls them or somehow they're intelligent enough to recognize that he's like the, a leader of some kind like well he he claims himself to be a god and he is very apocalyptic in the way he's he's like displayed through the yeah. text I, I think it'll be interesting to reread those because i remember not being super into like all those chapters in yeah. dance and dragons so i'm excited to reread those and take it take a deeper look because I do think Euron could. I mean, he's the only one that I can think of that would make sense. Makes sense to what? To to lead be like a others? figure, yeah, to lead the others because of all the apocalyptic. Uh, I just don't think we're going to meet like a leader unless I think unless they actually do thing. some kind of thing of like where I I don't know. I, like I'm trying to not take a lot of what the show did as like what George had in mind Cannon, yeah. because I find that there's got to be a different way to bring the wall down. Like, I don't think they're going to go north and try to kidnap a zombie no. and go to King's no. Landing and lose a dragon just to never raise happened. a dragon and be like, haha, now I can take the wall down. Like, yeah, I don't never think any of that's going to happen. No, it, that is such a TV move. And also, I think the Night King's a TV move. It absolutely uh, is. You know, to have... The, that's why um, you, when you said, do you think there's a Night King, I was like, something like that, meaning right. like a sort of more more better specialer central force of thinking power behind it all but not like <laughs> mr ice prince with the <laughs> horny head and the, yeah i i don't that. see it being like that um this is the issue and why we still don't have wins because i think going from initially having a trilogy to expanding it to where he did and now he's at five of seven this 
exactly becomes a problem because there's he did so go from much three happening. to five to seven. He said yeah. it would be. Well, it's also, I mean, it's the problem that like he, it's not like, okay, I need more than one book to wrap this up. It's like, well, but what if I also introduce a whole bunch of new plot threads and you're like, yeah. no, 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 you're supposed to use this to wind it down, wind it down. <laughs> yeah. He was definitely going more towards like the 10 book epic, you know? Yeah. Don't need to be on the same side for them to work. The same attractive. That dairy. That's a very good point. That's but what is the objective of the, of the others? Euron just wants to be a god. Yeah, it, it would appear. So um, I don't know. It, it'll be interesting. I'm really excited to reread those those uh, Iron Island chapters because I think uh, I missed a lot of those. Like I said, I'm not really big into the Iron Islands, to be honest. So it's probably it's my least. And it sucks. Oh, so that's interesting because yeah. like I'm always way more excited to read about the Iron Islands than about Danny. See, and I love Danny. I like so, Danny. I don't dislike Danny, but I just find like I don't know. You get so much about like the story and the world with Danny's chapter. But I guess I, just, sets I also continents with Danny. It's pretty I just impressive. I also feel like that it, I don't know, it bothers me uh, or maybe bothers isn't the right word, but I just feel like I have so much of a, a richer basis for context and knowledge of Westeros because there's so many yeah. eyes on Westeros and Danny all by herself so over separated. here the only eye on what's going on. I just I feel like I don't actually have a good grasp of like where she is and it's not because it's badly written it's just because I mean, she's the point, only though. eye on it yeah. and so i'm just yes. like she's just out over here whatever meanwhile westeros is rich with like oh and that's connected to this and connected to this and they've told me about this but they told me about it differently than how this person is telling mm -hmm. me about it because they're seeing I mean, that it could be on purpose though right so like you really were well, only getting her yeah but so i mean that's for that reason it's less exciting for me to read about because yeah, i'm like I oh a new it. weird thing in the desert yeah. cool <laughs> yeah and, and it's also very linear um like it's always where you left off usually with Danny. Um, I do think it's interesting that we're going to have more POVs from that and wins like with um, uh, Barristan. Barristan has a POV confirmed now. Mm -hmm. So, and then Tyrion's over there now. So like, I think it's going to get a lot more interesting, but I do think it's oh, impressive yeah. that he sets up continents worth of politics through one POV. Um, yeah. And it feels believable uh, for the most part being through like a 17 or 18 year old girl. Um, yeah, it's not that Danny's chapters are bad. It's just that yeah, she's no. the only one. And mm -hmm. like totally if fair. I only if, it, if all the chapters were where she, with all different characters where she is at and the only eyes we had on the north were John and we had no other idea for what's going yeah. on in Westeros. I'd be like, well, uh, OK, he's up there with some ice and some weird stuff's going on. But let's get back to the, yeah, <laughs> the and desert. John, where all John has Sam. Well, you know, uh, Danny doesn't have that the yin and yang uh, yeah that, 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 i think that's fair and, and, and to, to be honest like a lot of people struggle with danny chapters especially in dance yeah so um speaking of a dance of dragons uh vision five a cloth dragon sways on poles amidst a cheering crowd everyone thinks this is young griff being the mummer's dragon um probably i mean it's, <laughs> it's a target or yeah it's a targaryen banner at some point right of like being in charge somewhere yeah, Leading which an army, which is fair, I think um, this one. I, I have no idea. A great stone beast takes wings from a smoking tower, breathing shadows. Sounds like a stone dragon. Yeah, it sounds like a stone dragon or could it well, be I mean, stone? dragon stone? And that's where Melisandre and her shadows are. Mm -hmm. So like. But that already happened. Well, I guess I guess she could see some things that already happened, right? Well, yeah, she and, saw Rhaegar. and we we all know that like people think young Griff's a Blackfire or just a out mm -hmm. fraud, but maybe to Danny he's the Mummer's dragon because she's the dragon. You know what I mean? Like she has the dragons. Like yeah. wouldn't it be interesting that if he is legitimately Aegon, but she doesn't care? So yeah, young Griff and Danny are gonna fight for the throne. Yeah, but after uh, she sleeps with him, <sighs> certainly. <laughs> the more important tag here is the cheering crowd. Whoever Mummer's Dragon is loved. Yeah, I think I to not go off the rails here, but I think that young Griff will win King's Landing from Cersei because um, the people hate Cersei. <laughs> I think that's a pretty like bought bought into theory. Yeah. And then that's why I think Marjorie Marjorie always jumps Kings. And I see her jumping to young Griff's side to marry, to give a strong alliance. And I think Marjorie's Griff... entire plot line in all of a song of ice and fire. Thank you. Next. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, man. I'll survive another one. Uh... Um, Vision seven Daenerys silver, which is her horse. From, uh, her horse yeah. yeah. Her horse trots through grass to a darkling, a, a darkling stream under a sea of stars. 
I don't know what that means. Uh, <laughs> number eight, a corpse standing at the prow of a ship with bright eyes and gray smiling lips. I think that that is either, I think it's Euron, to be honest, because yeah. it's on a ship. Some people say it's grayscale. Like people seem to be really bought in on the grayscale having a huge impact, uh, which I could see maybe, but I think it's Euron. I think that one makes the most sense. Um, yeah, because the bright eyes, like if it was grayscale, I don't know that the bright eyes would be like, that impactful you'd be like this guy looks like he's made of stone yes and euron's eyes are very um they're described multiple times in the books so i think i think it's safe to say it's probably euron oh uh, that's a good one yeah her right through the nightlands. nightlands oh good one noel 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 knows her stuff man uh number nine a blue flower growing from a chink in a wall of ice filling the air with sweetness obviously this is john obviously right and the bell the bard story came right before this which is cool uh number 10 boneless terrible shadows roll inside of a tent obviously we know what that is a little girl like daenerys runs barefoot towards a big house with a red door uh mary Mazdor's death by pyre the mm -hmm. corpse of the wine cellar who had attempted poison on daenerys being dragged behind her silver number 14 a white lion running through tall grass i think that's Tyrion. Because it's a lion that is going through grass about as tall as them. So I figure it's Tyrion running, like, is coming to her. That's kind of what I maybe thought. He's a tall grass because he's so short. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm being heightest. Um, is that a Does word? Does the color of the lion signify? Well, that's that's what I also... I mean, lion, obviously, we, we relate with Lannister, but why is he white? Because he's also left his family. Like, he's um... not with them anymore. He doesn't side with them anymore. Yeah, and all and, the tar the Targaryens have white hair. Yeah, and you know another thing is like lions aren't white, so it's an outcast. It's different. It's a different. But again, if it's a lion. lion that's changed its colors to Targaryen colors, shit, you're right. Yeah, you're right because obviously a white lion, its its fur and hair is white. That actually. Secret Targaryen confirmed. Number 15, naked crones emerging from a great lake beneath the mother of mountains to kneel before Daenerys. I think that's alluding to her whenever she gets taken um, uh, to the place with all the other calls, wives. I can't remember. I asked um, Dothrak. Yes, thank you. I Do think you that's anything about these books. <laughs> I know it's, it's embarrassing, right? Uh, 16, 10,000 slaves crying mother as Daenerys rides past. Misa, Misa. Yes. So. So I think there's some stuff in here that's like really obvious. And then that's the last one. But there's also a lot of stuff in here that is very open for interpretation. Yeah. Um, you know, the prowl of the ship, probably you're on, but who knows? Uh, the Nightlands could be in there. And I like that George mixes in stuff from the past and obviously the future. It may be stuff that doesn't even ever happen, like seeing her son, um, Rego, right? Yeah. Burning cities. So it's like how much of this could have been, how much of it is, and how much of it will be. It's definitely a good thing they didn't cross the narrow sea with all of the Dothraki because they would just destroy everything. Yeah. White line is the color of the pelt that Drogo left her. Oh, because he killed a lion. Yeah, the pelt that Drogo gave her was of a white lion. So yeah. that could just be one of those that like it was just a, a thing that happened and it's not important. Yeah, I think that's fair. I could see that. I like the idea. But also, like Tyrion. giving an entire vision to that. Yeah, and also or like the tall grass the and lion being the Lannister, right? Like, could be. You know, I, I don't know. It's it's hard to say, um, and it, it's fun to speculate. Yeah. About what it might be. Oh, does Jimmy think it's fun to speculate? Shit. Like all, not all of her visions were things that are that interesting. Like, yeah, Miriam Asdor dying. We already Been saw there, that. Done the that. wine dying. We saw that. So, like Viserys dying, we saw that. Yeah, and I think also Euron being out the prowl of the ship makes a lot of sense because Euron's actually mentioned this book for the first time and how yeah. wicked he is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Euron's a big outstanding question. The reads are huge, right? Yeah. Alan reads the biggest miss opportunity from the show. Um, this is kind of random, but the reads in general just got shafted in the show. Yeah, they sure did. <sighs> Poor Mira. So bad. Uh, did we talk about the goat of Blackwater? Uh, no, we did not. We haven't um, even talked about Blackwater yet. 
No, the goat is Tyrion when he says, let's go kill those sons of bitches. I was like, let's go, dude. I'm in. So let's talk about Blackwater then. We talked about Danny. I mean, that's for the most part, that's what happens with her, right? The, house of the, the battle that's better than Helm's Deep, according to some. I mean, it's just incorrect. So I'm not even going to entertain it. Uh, Jimmy is wrong. And defend we'll, your position, Jimmy. We'll speak no more of this, Harris. Listen, I rewatched them both last year. No, N- not on make purpose. you an authority. I'm not hearing it. I'm, I'm just saying it wasn't nope. like a, a mm-hmm. uh, rose tinted glasses. Nope. I watched Blackwater Bay episode and I said, they really did like a whole hour to this battle. Mm-hmm. And I liked it more than Helm's Deep. I did. I did. It's just your affinity for A Song of Ice and Fire. A hundred percent. Slash, you've probably, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you've seen Lord of the, how many times you've watched Lord of the Rings, but also like, I feel like I know the Battle of Helm's Deep almost beat for beat versus a battle that I've only seen once before. It feels fresh and new because I haven't seen this like so many times that I could like yeah. say the lines with them. Yeah, I think I've seen Helm's Deep like, because even though I hadn't rewatched the films a ton, I, I've watched that scene like when my parents had on DVD, I would just replay it constantly. Um, Blackwater Bay, I think I've seen three or four times, but I'd say Home's Deep probably seen like 10, I'd say. So, I mean, I know it's not a popular opinion. Let's talk about Blackwater then. I mean, Blackwater's incredible. Um, The preparation, the the wildfire, everything that gets built up to that. But my favorite part's when the hound runs away and ends Mm -hmm. up in Sansa's room. So good. Also, the way that he's very traumatized by fire. He's like, fuck this. (laughs) Yeah, and and I believe it. Like, it's not not like... um, there's there's other series I can think of where they need a character to take a left turn and the character just takes the left turn. Uh, and I don't think that this is one of those circumstances. Like I, I believe Are you talking know, about season eight of Game of Thrones. I'm not. I'm actually I'm actually talking about a moment of memories of ice and Malazan, actually. Uh, there is just a moment Ooh, that, the tea. Shots yeah. fired. No, I love I love Malazan, but there is a character that makes a decision and I've heard the justification for why I did it and I just thought it was silly. Um, which is fine. It happens. But the hound could have very easily, he could have just like, I've had enough of this. But the hound remains the hound while somehow being a coward. Yeah. You know? Well, it's I also because, I mean, like the trauma over fire is well established. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. His brother so like the idea that he would like kind of lose it, like it's not, I mean, it has been set up very yeah. well. I don't remember if they said it in the book or if it's just the show. But when, Sa- when he's talking to Sansa after he's like fled the battle... She's like, what about the king? He's just like, fuck the king. It's so good. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. He's just done. So over it. And, you know, Tyrion leads the charge and he doesn't even, and he gives this amazing speech. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not asking you to fight for Joffrey, the king. I'm not asking you to fight for me. I'm not asking you to fight for the uh, high step. I'm asking you to fight. You know, this is your land stand. This means to take it. Let's go kill those sons of bitches. And then he runs off a dwarf. And does not look back to see if anyone follows him. Yeah. And it's like that little line that just makes Tyrion so much larger than life. And then he almost gets assassinated. Yeah. Um, by what is it, Mandon Moore, right? And yeah. then our boy Podrick. Podrick Payne. Good old Pod. Also cast <laughs> in the show. Hung like a horse. Uh just just <laughs> baby arm. Uh <laughs> oh my. They don't even make him pay. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's it's way more gruesome in the book too. Of like his, like the whole front of his nose gets cut off. Yeah, like, yeah. the gash is way bigger. And he already was much uglier than Peter Dinklage. Oh yeah, with. like his misshapen head and his discolored eyes, and like now he looks real pretty. And then him dealing with like the like being bandaged up and trying like taking it off and like seeing himself just super impactful. Yeah, yeah. The I, actual I, consequences, which is just—I yeah. mean—you've come to see from this series that consequences happen, but it's just in general, like the fact that like other books will have your hero get injured, and it's something to have a scene where they're abed and they have a bandage, and then it and, like, won't oh. actually matter. But like, yeah, they're like they're fine, and like it just makes them more badass. That like I took a wound, but like they're fine. Yeah, there, there's a book series that I really enjoyed that did that where the main character like literally gets like an armor, like his leg cut in half and it like doesn't matter because he just he just overpowers everybody anyway doesn't yeah matter. or takes like a gut wound and you're just like oh he lived yep. neat 
<laughs> yeah, Tyrion's face getting cut is also, I think, a catalyst for the beginning of his uh, changes because obviously, as we'll see in like the next book, like he loses his power um, and he starts to become much more dark uh, and, and gets ostracized even more by his father. So it's kind of like telling of what's about to happen for Tyrion. Mm-hmm. And we really, I mean, we know Cersei's shithead, right? Like, like yeah. we know Cersei's doing bad things, but like she tried to get him killed. Like mm-hmm. that—that's a whole nother step. Because if you remember, Tyrion even has a moment where he thinks about killing Joffrey to replace Tommen when Bronn kind of mentions that. Isn't it a shame Tommen's not the oldest? Mm-hmm. And Tyrion was like, "I would never do that." Like yeah. he's like, "I would never go there." And Cersei goes there. Yep. Oh man, Storm of Swords is gonna be so good. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm just excited to finally see more of Jamie. Yes, I agree. Yeah, we have yet to get much of him. To this well, we point. haven't had a POV from him at all. No, but yeah. I mean, even the scenes that he's been in, it's yeah. very little. Yeah, and his arc really does kick off in this book, too. So I, yeah, I, that's why I'm excited for Feast. I'm really excited to reread Feast and, and appreciate those Jamie chapters. For sure. Who have we not talked about yet? Uh, a small note, uh, Varys talks about how he became a eunuch and says that he oh, heard yeah. voices in the fire. Yeah. And he hates R'hllor, which yeah. is why he can never support Stannis's claim to the throne, uh, which I thought was interesting because, like, what voices did Varys hear in the fire? Well, was it R'hllor? You know, maybe. Like, it's, Varys is such an interesting character. Well, so, I mean, again, I just I appreciate so much that, like, because he, you do get enough pieces of information and enough conflicting pieces of information about peter baelish about varus about all these sort of people that like clearly know more than they're saying clearly do more than you know about and you just always have a sense that something more is happening so that there's something more behind it and mm-hmm. the fact that like george or R. R. martin doesn't feel the need to like be like okay so here it is here's all this clever stuff and here's like because you don't know that makes it like add so much to it i mean it's similar to like the hitchcock you know, method of like whatever you're whatever you don't see is a lot more terrifying than what I could show you. So like the fact that he doesn't tell you, he just gives you snatches of information. So mm-hmm. you're like, I can't even imagine all of the things that I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And it also he he kind of puts a lot of stock in uh, word of mouth, but also um, the power of personal testimony of events uh, like people write books all the time. Right. Like I died and saw heaven. And you're like, I mean, for me, it's like 99 percent. I'm like, no, you didn't. But. Uh, they saw I, R'hllor. <laughs> I even have someone in my family that claims this, and I'm like, no, you didn't. Uh, but there is 0.01% of me that goes, what if they're telling the truth? You would never know. You know what I mean? Like, what if it wasn't just some chemical reaction in the brain that formulated a vision, you know, like DMT release or something? Like, you I don't sound know. like those maesters that don't believe in magic. <laughs> I do. Yeah, Amy, I... are you behind I'll the be right disappearance back. of magic? Yeah, I, I actually am. Uh, I am responsible. Uh, I'm also responsible for the dragons disappearing. Uh, <laughs> I feel like, um, like, I don't know the timeline, but like, I feel like the, the doom in Valyria is all tied into this somehow. And I wish that we would ever have answers to that. But I actually don't even think if all the books are published, I don't think George is ever going to answer what happened in Valyria. I think it's just the doom. Like it's like you kind of said, it's up for interpretation. It's like a mystery, right? Like he's not going to just tell you how intricate the apocalypse was. Well, because that's the thing too. I mean, like when we in real life study history or whatever, Mm -hmm. or yeah, physics and like the, uh, the outer space, there are plenty of things that we're like, we're not sure. <laughs> well, even the, think about this, the Bronze Age collapse, which was an apocalyptic event. Yeah. No one knows why it happened. Uh, there's there's theories. There's sea people. Uh, there's simply just like a drought uh, and other things. But nobody knows what happened during the Bronze Age cla- collapse, except society almost, you know, went away. Uh, so in a lot of ways, I guess the doom's kind of like that. Like people have their theories, but no one really knows. Exactly. And I, like, I always say that worlds feel more real when things remain. Some parts of it still remain unknowable. I agree. Um, it's why I don't really care for hard magic systems that much. Um, it it becomes almost it's like memorizing my spells in an RPG. Like I have no interest in that. To be honest, it leaves no wonder. Yep. Fascination. Like I do think that you could do intriguing things with that that are compelling. Well, I mean, I think but, like 
I guess a hard magic system, as long as it leaves room, much like real world science, is like we have some pretty solid understanding of how this works that mm -hmm. we can like fun like a functioning knowledge. But at the same time, like we're constantly testing it and constantly realizing that like it actually doesn't work quite the way that we thought that it did. So like a hard magic system where like we have been using this and we have observed that it functions this way to the best of our knowledge, but leaving that like that room of like, but we're not totally sure that's the limit of it. We're not totally sure. We think this is why it does this, but we don't exactly know. So you have hard rules as far as we know. But as long as you leave that room for like, but that might not be it. Or it might not be quite what we think it is, but so far it functions like this, then it will still feel real and it still leaves that room for wonder. Yeah, I agree. I think that's like what magic is. Well, that's yeah. what makes it magic as opposed yeah. to chemistry or physics. Yeah, science. I don't know what's happening, but I agree. <laughs> We're talking about uh, how hard magic systems are boring unless you leave some room for... They're not but boring. are we sure it works like this? Yeah. We were saying we, we don't prefer hard magic systems because we like the... Uh, how it's, it's ambiguous. It, I mean, it's all subjective, right? And it depends on how sure. you do it. Like, sure. I love Allomancy and Mistborn. And there is that bit of, like, is this exactly how some things always work? And there is enough left open to where it's not always just cut and dry. But also soft magic systems, it's like, it can be cool because it's so open. And there's so many different possibilities. But also, it can feel cheap because Depending it's open. On how they use and you it, can yeah. kind of just be like, well, it just does this now. And you're like, oh, because the story needed it or what? Yeah, it's all about being very careful. Either way you go. Well, that's why also my preference tends to be towards very sparingly using magic, whether it's hard yeah, or soft. Yeah. Like that if you have a... Because it just to me, like the butterfly effect of a single thing being like different in this universe, which like changes the physics of this universe, that changes everything. And now mm -hmm. if you throw in a bunch of different kinds of magic that you use all the time, I'm like, I don't think you've thought through the repercussions of all of those things and how they would affect how people behave, how they function, how they think, how society would be structured, how travel would be changed, how like the economy would be different. Like, I don't think you've thought this through. And so your world feels fake to me. <laughs> or yeah, they just don't think about a lot of that because it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, it might matter to some people, Alex. No, it doesn't doesn't matter well if their world doesn't matter to them then their world doesn't matter to me let's go Fair point. all right who have we not touched on yet have we missed any i don't think we missed any povs no we we've we've hit everything i think of all the things have we well i mean all the povs yeah right. i was deleting my notes as as we crossed them off and i'm empty so it doesn't it doesn't <laughs> um yeah i mean I guess where did I don't even remember where does this book end with? Who does it end with? I don't even remember. <laughs> Bran. So, right? so Bran sees Winterfell burning, but knows that the crypts are the real Winterfell, um, yeah. and that they will last just like he will. Um, John kills Corn half hand and is kind of a cliffhanger ending. Mm -hmm. And Tyrion is recovering and sends away the Maester that Cersei okay. sent. That he was following the Queen's orders, and he's like get out of my room yeah i don't want your milk of the poppy or whatever else is He's in like, it give me wine. and he said podrick yeah podrick give me some wine. wine get me a new maester i'm out of he this downs all the wine and you can see immediately a Tyrion's in like a frantic state of paranoia yeah so where, where do you leave theon because he because he like wakes up afterwards right like don't we get some chapters after mm. ramsey takes winterfell or no 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 he's knocked out Winterfell's taken. So th there's a lot of cliffhangers in this book. Yeah. Um, if which George <laughs> seems to love. I mean, every uh, ending chapter is basically a cliffhanger. Yeah, Theon is is a cliffhanger. I think Catelyn's last. Oh yeah, Catelyn's last chapter is it appears that she killed Jamie because she asked for her sword, Brienne's sword. I mean, you know that's not gonna right. But in the book, if if it was at release, we'd be going. Do you think she killed? You know. I... I wish I could no, no. like read these books as they release. Like I think oh, I would have right. been really cool. at the same I time though. Have, like I, I knowing Catelyn and what she's like, I don't think I would have ever believed that. I'd be like, well, we're meant. This is meant to be like to trick you, but of course she didn't kill. But Jane. also, if you just read or watch anything, it's like if you don't show me a body, you don't see it happen. It didn't happen. Well, unless, that's, that's unless fair. it's the TV show Game of Thrones but... where it cuts to black when Brienne kills Stannis and he actually dies. Which but. In 1998, in 2000, 
you might have believed it. That's what I said. I mean, it was just like knowing I mean, what Catelyn is like as a person. Bad. Like Catelyn's character, I was just like, well, she wouldn't. Her mind at the time had to have been pretty rough, though, because she had just yeah. found out that her R Rickon and, and Bran had died. Yeah, but she is the one that constantly says that she wants the girls back, and she knows mm -hmm. that Jamie's the only way that she can get her girls back. Yeah, that's fair. And I if she's if she's lost children, she's gonna hang on to even yeah. more to the ones that she's got left. He's just antagonizing her so much that I remember feeling like it's like talking about having sex with her. <laughs> yeah, and he talks about pushing Bran out the window. And saying, I wish yeah. he would have died. When he talks about him being more honorable than Jamie or yeah. than, than Ned. Ned. Yeah. And Which I always love. If you think about <laughs> it, yes, I've only been true. a fun Yeah, that was pretty low below there by old uh, Jamie boy. He is also. That, is that the line that triggers her to be like, Brienne, give me my sword? And he's also being super honest. Oh, yeah. It's and the most honest says, the entire thing. But then he says, that dagger that went to kill your son was not Tyrion's. Mm -hmm. He said, if I wanted your son dead, I would have went and killed him myself. Yeah. So now, as readers, if we don't know, who then tried to kill Bran? Mm -hmm. And the dagger must have belonged to Peter Baelish. Yep. Well, also the amount of times that Tyrion is like glaring at him over that dagger. Yeah. And also now looking back on it, it's so obvious that Tyrion wouldn't have bet it against Jamie ever. Yeah. It's like, For sure. why didn't I realize that when I first read this book's great. Yeah. I think it it's was, one of the best sequels. Who else? I guess with Sansa. Where did we leave? Yeah, we, with her? Well, we talked about Sansa, but not much. I'm just saying, where did we leave with her? She, she leave leaves her. off where Marjorie Tyrell is going to become right. Joffrey's new bride, and it's like oh, she, yeah, we talked about that. She yeah. might be free. Who knows? Like Marjorie took no time at all to do that. It was like Renly dies to a shadow. She's just like, I'm, just Hi. Again, <laughs> I'm out. Yeah, Marjorie Tyrell is like an interesting character because like you could hate her for being such a like super sneaky, being she's opportunist. Yeah, that's Wait. a good that's a good way to put it. Opportunist. But she's also going to put Joffrey in check, so it's like she's kind of good and she befriends Sansa. So it's like I switch between Sansa and Sansa. I can't. Roy's ruined me. I think it's Sansha. <laughs> Sashquan sauce. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but Sansa is, is is befriended kind of by Marjorie Tyrell, and even if it is superficial, it still yeah. is like a real. It's a relief, for sure. Um, I think normally I would say Sansa, but since everyone on the show is also English and say Sansa, it's like it's just well, Sansa. it kills me the ones that can't pronounce the R in Arya's name, and they say Arya. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Ah yeah, <laughs> ah yeah. <laughs> like it's like a, that's the moment you realize George R. R. Martin is not English because he wrote a name like Arya. Like, <laughs> yeah. You say it as an American, it's Arya, but if you're English, ah, Arya. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like you're gargling. <laughs> oh, George, George, pretend to be British. What a lad. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm trying to remember where Samwell leaves off. We don't have a Samwell chapter here, right? No, you don't get a POV. I mean, you you have the whole Crasser's Keep, which of course ends differently because they don't get. They don't get kicked out the way that they did. Like John doesn't sneak up on Craster giving his tribute. It's Gilly just tells them about it. And Sam is just kind of like, well, we have to take her because she's a girl and she talks to me. <laughs> Sam, <Like, laughs> What a God. So you don't get too much more than that. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't think you get really much more of Sam other than that little glimpse of him and John's chapters. Yeah. And him talking about the Citadel Scrolls, he actually mentions the Children of the Forest, mm -hmm. which is which is pretty cool. Um, I think that's going to definitely play a role uh, a role when he gets to the Citadel and he's talking to people and whatever, however that ends up tying up. Well, I mean, Bran also talks about the Children of the Forest. With, yeah, uh, yeah. His name Lewin. Well, he is a Green Seer, so and Jojen, yeah. yeah. I mean, the reads are, are fascinating and the fact that his father sent him and it was like right at the time, like where Ned died. It's like very convenient timing. Yeah. Helen Reed is like one of the he's the only other person that knows about the birth. Yeah. He's a that, total that wild card of. in the story. He Even really is like what his play will be. I like the theory. Actually, I don't like the theory um, that he's the high Septon. Really? Because the high How Septon comes out of nowhere. Theory. Well, the High Septon brings like all these followers and stuff. Why would Howard do that though? To get revenge on Cersei for his best friend. I, 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 there's mm -hmm. also a lot of other stuff like where people link the way he state all this stuff. But, um, 
we could talk about when we do feast. I don't actually subscribe to it, and I would be disappointed if he was. Yeah. Um, one because I think that that's an interesting storyline by itself, mm -hmm. and two, Hallen I think has to play a much bigger role than that. Yeah, some pettiness. Like, I think he has to interact with John possibly. I mean, he has to be the one that tells John, right? Yeah. Like, in the I, show, the show sucks. <laughs> At the end of it, okay. You mean but when they, they cut just, away? They forgot Helen yeah. Reed even existed, and just it hurts. Like, who else would tell John? Like the crack, how Samwell. Would, how would say? Yeah, but Sam would have to find out. It, I agree. The I only mean, the only way would be if Samwell found somehow at the Citadel. That, but that doesn't. Even, that still doesn't make much sense, right? Like I just don't yeah. see it happening. So, Helen would have to interact with them at some point and let him know. Yeah. Or we um, never know. Who knows? Maybe it doesn't happen. Yeah. I feel like it has to, though. Derry said, Helen Reed is married to a hiding, in hiding Ashara Dane, who is uh, Mira's mama. I think Ashara Dane is probably dead, but she could also, I, I don't know. Ashara Dane's very interesting. She She's mentioned way too many times to be just some throwaway, mm -hmm. I killed myself over Ned uh, character. She She's important. She's probably Sept uh, the Septa that's with Young Griff, if I had to guess. But see, I gotta brush up on my, all my Song of Ice and Fire theories because I lived on them for ever, and I've well, got so many of them. We're about to get into the like Storm of Swords. We start seeing a lot form, but four and five are where where the bread and butter's at, really. Yeah, because so many new things are introduced. Um, it, it's gonna which be, again I, is like, sir, <laughs> sir, sir, the way you're supposed to be bringing us into the conclusion mm -hmm. here. Do you think he was just having so much fun <laughs> that he was like, I'm just gonna keep going? I mean, probably, but also it's like at a certain point it gets convoluted in your own head because yes, Robert Jordan was doing the same thing. Like, if you read up to Knife of Dreams, the next book was supposed to be a memory of light. And it, he wanted it to be like 1,400 pages long and be the end. And that got split into three books that are all like 1,000 pages each to yeah. flesh out the ending. It's like right. where where that book leaves off, it's like, how are you going to just do this in a book? Yeah. Like you can't. So. Yeah, and it may be some, you know, I also wonder, because Robert Jordan and Gurm were apparently friendly, I wonder if he saw what, what Jordan was doing and was like, oh, I can go bigger. I mean, that's probably what it just as he was telling it was probably just like, oh, I want to do this. Oh, I want to do this. Oh, I could do this. This means this. And like just kept going. George R. R. Martin writing was literally the same as Jimmy is during the lives where he was just like, oh, his head just what if I, oh, what if, yeah, ooh, that would be good. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to think me and Gurm have a lot in common. Um, I, I have a conductor hat. You so does he. Beard. I can't grow a beard, but I did buy a paste on one um, for when I hey, maybe maybe George's isn't real. I mean, it, it's pretty bad. It's patchy. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it was taped on. Yeah, Jules sure. and I'm Zeph sure showing up? Beard. Certainly. I'm sure. Dude wanted to put a moat around his house, and they were like, sir, you can't do that. And he was like, what do you mean I can't do that? Yeah. <laughs> I, think we, I think we've covered it. I think we've covered Clash Kings. Now I'm just thinking about like the whole Arthur Dane thing. It's interesting when you look at how many, uh, you know, Starfall and the Morning Star, all this stuff, like the Dornish references. It's like it's almost too on the nose where you're like something had to have mattered there. Yeah. I'm just trying to think of like if he's actually dead or not. It, it doesn't make sense that Ned or Helen Reed could kill him. It doesn't it make doesn't. any sense. And Corn Halfham was a pretty studious guy. Um, and if he knew that Liana, you know, was in love, it, it's hard to say though, because like Ned's coming because he thinks Liana's being captured. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, how does corn relay? Like, no, they're actually in love. It, it, it's messy. It doesn't, it doesn't add up. Yeah. It's, it's weird. <laughs> Ned's sword skills are also very ambiguous. Yeah, for sure. You know, like he doesn't battle Jamie at all in the books. Um, we don't see him at hand-to-hand -hand combat. He was clearly Robert's second, right? Mm -hmm. Him and Aaron. But that is mean, shit. The only combat you see him in is when they come at him outside the brothel. Yeah. And then Jamie rides away. Yeah. 
and Ned takes uh, Ned fall his horse falls on his leg instead of being stabbed through the leg. Yeah. Oh, uh, one thing I want to mention. Well, you know what was really interesting to me that I had forgotten is that Renly is described as looking just like Robert. Mm-hmm. Like it's like he's like another Robert. Like he's a splitting image of Robert. Yeah. Um, which is why I think a lot of people probably like him because he's a lot more jolly than Robert and more friendly, um, but still has like that you know burly kind of look to him. Uh, that was something I had forgotten. I thought that he was very soft faced and all that stuff, but he wasn't. He, he you know, he, he yeah. had the Baratheon look where Stannis mm-hmm. did not look like his brothers. No, Stannis is the man also is just like grizzled and Stannis bad. is Stannis. There's he's something roughly. like so like you know childish about Stannis where he's just like, but it's not fair. It should be <laughs> mine. And you're like, get over it. <laughs> yeah, it's very elementary. And very um, black and white. Well, we're at about two and a half hours, and I think so. I think we probably, have an hour and a half to go. <laughs> there's probably more we could talk about, I'm sure, but I think we've done a pretty good job of talking about the Crown of Kings. A, a, uh, crown, a crown, crown of Kings. Kings. This is where I'm at in life now. <laughs> Are you the narrator book of the book? <laughs> <laughs> Braun. <laughs> The Clash of Kings is the book I'm, of course, talking about. The Crown of Kings isn't the book that we read. So, <laughs> not the one I read. I must have. It's good yeah. it lined up so well. Um, thank you all for watching. I'm several of you stuck through this entire thing. I appreciate you. That's, yeah, me and Jimmy. That's incredible. <laughs> wow. Okay. We're, I guess we're just patting ourselves on the back now. Is that yes. that's happening? Okay, yes, cool. absolutely. Um, but yeah, it's it's getting late. I am ready for bed. It's 11.30, and we've been talking for two and a half hours. It's only 8.30. Listen, California. On the best coast. Yeah. <laughs> the beast coast, east coast. <laughs> Does that work? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. We will be, I believe, on Jimmy's channel for the next book, A Storm of Swads. I don't think we figured what? out when. <laughs> Yeah, we'll figure it out. It'll it'll be towards the end of December, obviously before New Year's, maybe that. I have the whole week off after Christmas, so I'm open anytime then. We'll, we can figure it out. I'm really yeah. excited for this, man. This is my favorite have, book, by the way. Like Storm of Swords is my favorite book of all time. So I have the whole week. Is it before or after? I'll have to look. I have one of those weeks, the whole week off. But take off after. As long as it's yeah, as long as it's always at night like this, for me, I'm fine whenever. So yeah. unless it's like Christmas. Nice. Alex is actually coming here and we're going to do it. We're going to be in the same room. Oh, we so. You're going to be in the gym. We should do that. Alex does love the workout. I'll be in the gym. Jazzer size while we talk house. about it. I think about doing a, like a video, like books for biceps and Anytime. storm of swords would be like one of them, you know, like, I'll, I'll anyway. show myself out. <laughs> if we could swing that, that would be sweet. Um, we'll talk about it. We'll see. Hell yeah. And I have to convince my wife that I'm driving up to I would Maryland for a night to talk about <laughs> a book. I have plenty of scotch. There you go. All right. We'll figure out the next day. It'll be on Jimmy's <laughs> channel at some point in time in December. So thanks again for watching. Until next time. Ta-ta. Wave. Winter's coming. <laughs>